script to go through. So uh, we'll turn on our streaming here and I've got a message that we're streaming. So I think we're all set on that, Christian. Great. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Health Coverage, Insurance, and Financial Services. We are assembled electronically today uh, for the purpose of hearing from our in interested parties who appear before us regularly um, as a part of our orientation um, today. Before we get started, um, just want to share some uh, information about this electronic format that we're using um, as we're all still getting used to it. The meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. You can find that on the committee's website in the top right hand corner. This means that anyone who is a participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. Um, I would ask at this time that our committee members mute their microphones when they aren't speaking, including right now. Um, people testifying cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak, or in this case, not testifying, but introducing themselves. Um, and um, just a note about that uh, for all the folks who are joining us as participants, as uh, attendees in our um, webinar format on Zoom today. Uh, when you are um, going to be called upon to speak or about to be called upon to speak, we will be promoting you uh, from attendee to panelist. And there's a bit of a process there where it appears like Zoom might have quit um, and uh, is, has kicked you out of the meeting. Um, don't panic, don't touch anything. And uh, within a few seconds, um, you will appear uh, as part of our Brady Bunch um, on the screen and uh, able to turn your video on and able for us to unmute you at that time. So um, we will take care of pulling you into the panelist role and then pushing you back out to the attendee role. And this will be our first experiment with doing that on a grand scale. So uh, bear with us as we work through that process this morning. The meeting will be recorded and available to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after the meeting has concluded. Um, and uh, let's see, a couple of other important notes before we get to committee introductions. Um, please uh, rename yourself um, as the name that you signed up to um, speak to us on, your screen name on. Uh, Zoom needs to be something um, akin to your first and last name so that we can find you rather than looking for dad's laptop in the list of attendees. Um, and you can do that by clicking on the three dots on the top right of your Zoom square. Um, and you can change, you can rename yourself. Um, that will help us find you so that we can promote you to a uh, uh, panelist. Um, all right. Uh, I think um, with that, we will go. I've got a couple more comments about how we'll proceed um, timing wise here this morning. But uh, first, let's just do committee introductions. Um, so uh, to that end, let's start with um, Representative uh, Matheson. Good morning, my name is Christy Matheson. I represent District 1, Kittery. Representative Quinn. Yes, my name is Tracy Quint and I represent District 144, which is Holton, Hodgson, Amity, Cary, Silver Ridge, Selden, Weston, and Hainesville. Wonderful. Uh, Representative Arford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I represent District 49, which is the western half of Brunswick. Great. Representative Evans. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I am uh, Richard uh, A. Evans. I represent District uh, 120, Dover Foxcroft, and surrounding communities. Representative Morris.
Good morning. I'm Representative Joshua Morris. I am from Turner. I represent Health District 75, the towns of Turner, Leeds, and Livermore. Thank you. Representative Blyer. Yes, good morning. I'm Representative Mark Blyer. I live in Buxton. I represent District 22, which is uh, Limington and part of Buxton, Standish, and Limerick. Thank you. Representative Melrano. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gina Melarano. I represent House District 62, which is part of Auburn. Rose, Senator Brenner. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stacy Brenner, and I represent Senate District 30, which is Scarborough, Gorham, and Buxton. Thank you. Representative Tepler. Good morning. I seem to have a problem with the home telephone line ringing so please forgive that being in the background um i am not answering um but i am representative denise tepler co-chair of the committee and i represent house district number 54 which is all of the town of Topsom. great and um my name is heather sanborn i represent senate district 28 which is half of portland and half of westbrook we are assisted today um, by our clerk, Christian Ritchie, and by our analyst from the Office of <clears throat> Legal uh, Policy and Legal Anal Analysis, uh, Colleen McCarthy-Reed, and looking forward to seeing how the technology uh, works today. So um, we are uh, going to be using a two-minute clock today. Um, Representative Tepler is going to be in charge of the two minute clock and she uh, has just a little kitchen timer for us. We're going kind of low tech, although it's a digital kitchen timer. It's not just, you know, a crank one. Um, but uh, when your two minutes have expired, you will hear um, the beeping in her part of the Zoom window. Um, we are going to, as I said, have two minutes per person. But please be aware that we may have a little bit of bumpiness as we pull attendees in and out um, to speak to us. Um, and I think we'll get better at that as we go along. So this is a wonderful chance for us to um, give it a shot. Um, <clears throat> and we may pull people in one or two ahead of where they're gonna be able to speak. So please do just keep your microphone on mute when you are pulled into the um, panel as part of the meeting. Um, I think uh, other than just to say that we are at home, um, most of us, and um, therefore you may see children, dogs, um, and house phones um, interrupting the meeting from time to time. We're gonna try and minimize that impact as much as we can, but please do bear with us as we I use this new technology. A reminder that we should not be using the Zoom chat function except for, for administrative um, concerns. We will not be using it for any substantive discussions. And if you wish to speak, um, please just um, raise, uh, this is for committee members, uh, use the raise hand function uh, or wave at me in the screen and I'll do my best um, to um, call on you. All right. So uh, we are working. Sanborn? Yeah, Representative yes. Tepler, what did I forget? Thank you. No, it's just that one of our members will have to um, interrupt us by saying Madam Chair because she's on the telephone. Right. Great. Perfect. Um, all right. Um, with that, uh, I will just read off the first um, three names on our list and then we can start with the first one. So the, the first three folks I have on the list are Bruce Garrity from Pretty Flaherty, Chris O'Neill from O'Neill Policy Consulting, and Dan Bernier from the Law Office of Daniel Bernier. And so with that, we are pulling those folks in and um, we will hear first from Bruce Garrity. Mr. Garrity, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Um, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee, my name is Bruce Garrity. I've had the privilege of appearing before this committee for 42 years now. And uh, my clients before your committee are primarily uh, insurance and consumer credit uh, interest 
clients. I represent the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, which is the uh, largest association of insurance carriers in the country. They represent the largest, uh, a large percentage of the insurers who do business in Maine. I also represent AIG, an individual insurance company. Both are in the property casualty field. I also represent the Maine Automobile Dealers Association in several ways. You'll hear the word MIWA during the course of the uh, legislative session. That's a multiple employer welfare arrangement, uh, which is essentially a health insurer self-insurer. Uh, the, the auto dealers have one. They also have a workers' compensation trust and uh, they care about uh, consumer and consumer credit issues. I also represent AFLAC, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with and it does uh, supplemental insurance policies. I also represent Anthem, uh, insurance company, again, which we're all familiar with in the uh, health insurance field. I represent the Maine Optometric Association, which are the association of optometrists in Maine. Uh, they're the primary health care, uh, eye care uh, providers in Maine, and they'll be uh, concerned with provider issues. I also represent the US, U.S. Travel Insurance Association. We had legislation last session, which the uh, committee worked on and passed out unanimously. Unfortunately, it didn't get passed. Uh, and um, it's back in front of you. I also represent the Motor Vehicle Personal Protection Association, which wants to amend the contract law. And I also represent a company called Teladoc, which assists in providing telemedicine uh, services uh, in Maine. You have a lot of telemedicine bills uh, before you. I'm really proud of uh, seeing Representative Tepler's clock that I managed this in, uh, in two minutes. And thank you for uh, listening to me. I look forward to well work. done, Mr. Garrity. You got us off on the right foot. I appreciate that very much. Mr. O'Neill, you're next. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris O'Neill. I live in Portland. I'm the principal of O'Neill Policy Consulting Incorporated. Uh, I've been lobbying uh, for various clients since 2005. Uh, I seldom mention it, but Prior to being a lobbyist, I actually did some time as a legislator when legis being a legislator was an easy job. That was before email. Um, this session you will uh, hear from, and I even sat on the committee that you're on. This session you'll hear from me on behalf of uh, Delta Dental. Delta Dental Plan of Maine is one of three uh, Northeast de dental service companies in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. Uh, Headquarters is in Concord, New Hampshire, and the main offices are in my original hometown of Saco. The, um, the Delta Dental Plan of Maine uh, has more than 2,300 employers who are subscribers, and about 350,000 people are covered by Delta Dental plans. Uh, many of them, about 20,000, do so right through Delta's private exchange. Delta covers me deltacoversme.com, and uh, about 4,000 more uh, have joined via the federal exchange. Delta's mission is a 501c4 is uh, to make oral health education and dental services more widely available. Uh, for more than 20 years, uh, the Northeast Delta Dental Foundation, which is a C3, has awarded numerous grants to uh, various charitable organizations that promote oral health all across Maine. And uh, Delta Dental has been since uh, its inception, uh, UNE's uh, College of Dental Medicine's uh, major benefactor. Uh, as a carrier of so-called limited benefit insurance, uh, Delta will occasionally send me in to talk to you uh, about broader health insurance legislation that may or may not apply to Delta and in some cases applies to Delta uniquely. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Neill. Representative Tepler, I'll just let you know that when you're muted, we can't hear the clock. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind for future uh, folks. The um, next person on our list is Dan Bernier, and then we'll hear from David Clough, Catherine Pelletro, um, and the folks from Maine Health. Alrighty, Mr. Bernier, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Dan Bernier. I'm an attorney from Waterville, Maine. I represent the Maine Insurance Agents Association, which is an association of insurance agents from across the state, primarily focused on property and casualty insurance, licensing issues, those types of issues. 
I also represent the main chapter of the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, which is a statewide association of insurance agents more focused on life, disability insurance, long-term care, health issues, financial service products. Um, I do have a couple of other clients that I probably won't appear before this committee on very often. I've been doing this since 1993, and I can confirm that's the first time Mr. Garrity's ever finished in two minutes. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, but I think I will finish with some spare time. I will say technology makes me a little nervous. I'm a proud dinosaur, so it'll be a little interesting after all these years switching to lobbying over technology. Um, and uh, I think I'm done with some time to spare. So far, so good, Mr. Bernier. You had your camera on. You had no trouble with unmuting. So, um, so far, you've been a technological whiz. So we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clough, uh, do we, uh, Christian, do we need to pull more folks in? Okay, it's just gonna take a minute. We can let our first three folks go as well. Bye, thank you. Here's Excellent. Here. All right, Mr. Clough, go ahead. Good morning, uh, Senator Sanborn. And uh, Madam Chair and, and Representative Tepler, members of the committee. My name is David Clough. Um, I have two lobbying clients in the legislature. One is Maine Staffing Association, which you will not be hearing from uh, probably on your issues. The other that I'm best known for is NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Business. I've been this uh, contract state director since the early 1980s. Uh, I've got a handout that I prepared this morning and passed along to Colleen, who will get it to you when she has an opportunity. NFIB has a very large membership and diverse membership in Maine and nationally uh, in every legislative district in the House, except one in every Senate district. The uh, issues you'll hear from me most likely this session will be uh, those regarding health insurance costs and availability, and then other matters that have a significant impact on small uh, businesses, small employers. Uh, lastly, uh, my goal is to provide you with information and insight, the per perspective from the viewpoint of NFIB members and help you understand how they see things and how they believe uh, your decisions will affect their ability to maintain jobs, sustain their businesses and grow for the future. Uh, with that, I'll end, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. It's quite all right. Um, I, I saw that Representative Brooks had joined. Uh, Representative Brooks, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I apologize for not being on sooner. My name is Heidi, Representative Heidi Brooks. I represent House District 61, which is part of Lewiston. And I did hear the first two speakers on the webinar as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, representative, or not representative. Um, <laughs> next, we will hear from Catherine Pelletro from the Maine Association of Health Plans. Go ahead, Ms. Pelletro. Good morning, everyone. Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, members of the committee. Thank you for providing this opportunity today. My name is Catherine Pelletro. I run a trade association for health insurers in the state called the Maine Association of Health Plans sometimes referred to as MEAP. We have five members. It's Aetna, CVS Health, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Cigna, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Community Health Options. Our members collectively either provide or administer coverage to over 600,000 Maine people. The mission of our organization is to improve the health of Maine people through the provision of affordable, safe, and coordinated healthcare. You will see me testify before you on bills that impact health insurers, their customers, or their members, and on which they agree. So I will just stop there. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with all of you. Good luck. Thank you, Ms. Pelletro. So far, so good. We're, uh, we're, we're zooming through this technology as it were. Um, all right. Um, I see Ms. Calder from Maine Health. Go ahead. Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee. I'm Sarah Calder, Director of Government Affairs for Maine Health. Um, Katie Fulham-Harris wasn't able to join us this morning, so she sends her apologies. 
Um, Maine Health is a nonprofit integrated healthcare system comprised of nine local health systems that serve the residents of 11 counties in Maine and one in New Hampshire. We also provide a continuum of behavioral health services across our footprint through Maine Behavioral Healthcare. We have a home health agency and a reference lab that's been instrumental in supporting COVID-19 testing during the pandemic. We're the largest private employer in the state of Maine and every day Maine Health's team of over 20, 23,000 employees work to fulfill our vision of working together so our communities are the healthiest in America. And to the end, we care for all patients regardless of their ability to pay and we provide free care to all patients at 200% of the federal poverty level, which is above and beyond the state requirement of 150%. Uh, we're fully committed to providing high quality and accessible healthcare for all Mainers. Uh, in fact, all eligible Maine health hospitals recently received an A safety rating from the LeapFrog group and all of our four eligible rural hospitals were designated as a LeapFrog top rural hospital of which there were only 19 in the entire country. Maine was one of five states with the highest percentages of A hospitals, which is something that we should all be incredibly proud of. Um, access is an increasing challenge, both from the points of sustainability for our providers and affordability for patients. And we look forward to working with this committee um, to address that important topic this session. Now to address the elephant in the room, um, hopefully I have enough time, um, which is COVID-19. So as of the beginning of January, Maine Health has cared for 62% of the total hospitalized COVID patients across the state. Our labs have completed nearly 30% of the total COVID tests that have been run. And as you may know, Maine Health has stepped up to provide vaccines to the communities that we serve across Maine. I see I have two seconds left. I will just say that Katie and I will always be a resource to this committee if you have any questions about the vaccine rollout or the work that we're doing on COVID, please let me know. Um, and uh, just thank you so much. Look forward to working with you this session. Thank you, Ms. Calder. That was important information there at the end. So thank you for your work on um, keeping us in our community safe. Um, Dan Morin from the Maine Medical Association is next and following him, we'll hear from Allison Perrin Drag from the Maine Heart Association, Bill Ferdinand from the Maine Ambulance Association and Ann Robinson from Pierce Atwood. Hi, I Dan, know you sick of hearing, you can hear that, you can hear me, correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, Senator Sanborn. Uh, my name is Dan Morin. I am the Director of Communications and Government Affairs for the Maine Medical Association, uh, an association formed in 1853. It's the largest organized physician group in Maine representing more than 4,300 physician members, including residents and medical students. Um, Dr. Evans on your committee is an active member. I am a constituent of Senator Brenner. My daughter and I spoke to her on election day in front of Gorham High School. It was a pleasant conversation. Uh, born and raised in Lewiston, so hello, uh, Representative Brooks. And I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I helped uh, reduce the business impact of COVID on Senator Sanborn's uh, business by purchasing, uh, purchasing much of her product uh, during the pandemic. Um, so the <laughs> we have two programs that I thought would be interesting uh, for the committee uh, to, uh, to, to hear about. Uh, our mission is to support Maine physicians, advance the quality of medicine in Maine and to promote the health of all Maine citizens. One of the programs that's relatively new under the Maine Medical Association that we think would be helpful is the Center for Quality Improvement. Uh, the MMA launched the MMI, MMA CQI uh, last October. Um, they are all original staff from the days of Maine Quality Counts, who knows uh, about that organization that was formed back in 2003 uh, that was focused on health improvement, collaboration, and several in initiatives to improve healthcare payment and delivery system reform in Maine. Um, one of which uh, was a program called Caring for Maine, which was developed in partnership with MMA to help address the opioid epidemic and also quality improvement support for the state's Health Homes Initiative, which is a DHHS program to improve care and outcomes for Maine care members. We also have the Medical Professionals Health Program. That's a program that assists health professionals challenged with substance abuse, mental health and behavioral health issues, as well as stress and burnout. Uh, they provide confidential monitoring support, treatment resources, advocacy, education and outreach. It's a program that welcomes those voluntarily seeking assistance before their licensing is impacted, as well as those who have been referred by licensing boards in order to maintain or regain their licensure. It covers six professional groups, including physicians. So it's not just physicians, also nurses, PAs, dental professionals. And the need and use of the MPHP was high even before the pandemic. 
and its funding was, was, was pretty fluid. So uh, COVID-19 has greatly exacerbated those issues of stress and burnout. And you're gonna be seeing a bill this year uh, before the legislature sponsored by um, Senator Brenner, thankfully, um, to stabilize funding for the critical program. Um, many patients need a healthcare system and structure that allows them to receive the care they need when and where they need it. Our focus is on less interference and red tape so physicians can give patients the time they need, reduce government and insurance company interference, and also their uh, physicians and uh, your constituents and their patients are looking for support from each of you to slash away at the paperwork, other intrusions into patient care. Uh, Thank you, tasks. Mr. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Morin. I appreciate it. And just a note to my co-chair, I can't hear your timer. I don't know if others can, but I haven't been able to hear it. So um, I'll just mention that. I can see it when you put it up, but I can't hear it. Thank you so much, Mr. Morin. I believe that um, uh, Allison Peron Drag from the American Heart Association is not on our uh, attendee list, um, but if uh, if she is and she's listening, please rename yourself to that name so that we can find you in our attendee list. Mr. Ferdinand is next. Um, excuse me one second, Mr. Yeah, Ferdinand Representative and, Tepler. and Senator Sanborn. Uh, I will attempt to unmute in time for you to hear it. I also um, didn't want it to go too long, so shut it off, but um, we'll try to leave it on long enough so folks can hear it. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Mr. Ferdinand. Oh, hi, hopefully you don't need it for me. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Ferdinand. I'm a lawyer and lobbyist with Eaton Peabody Law Firm. I live in Brunswick, uh, so Representative Arford is my uh, legislator in part of, the, part of the town where I live in. Um, we represent the Maine Ambulance Association, which is a, the trade association for um, the majority of the ambulance services in the state of Maine, uh, probably three quarters of the, of the operations in Maine are a part of the association. And they range from um, hospital-based systems or, or services to private services to municipal services. So large and small, uh, we represent the, the emergency medical service field uh, before this committee. And <clears throat> last session, a bill was passed to do a study on rate setting for these services for under the private insurance model. And um, there's been a work group working on that. So you're gonna be hearing that report coming back. Um, the insurance carriers and Lambians folks were on it. Um, so that issue is gonna be before you this session. Um, other than that, Eaton Peabody is also a, um, has Gretchen Jones working with me. She's an expert in banking law. So you may see her working with some of our banking clients you know, before your committee as well. Great, thank you, Mr. Ferdinand. Um, Ms. Robinson. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee. My name is Ann Robinson. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of Pierce Atwood. I'm a career-long lobbyist, and I also maintain an active administrative law practice. I was born and raised in Lewiston, and I currently reside in Portland. And um, just like to briefly outline the clients uh, for which or for whom I typically appear before uh, this committee. So, um, well, first is American Express, which is a premier travel and financial services company with a well-earned reputation for world-class customer service. I represent the American Council of Life Insurers or ACLI, which advocates on behalf of its 280 member companies that are dedicated to providing products and services that promote consumers' financial and retirement security. I represent Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, which is comprised of the country's leading um, innovative biopharmaceutical research companies that are devoted to discovering lives that improve um, the health of people in Maine. And of course, a number of their members um, have been playing a vital role in bringing an end to the devastating pandemic that we confront. Um, I represent Merck individually, um, which um, is at the forefront of research to prevent and treat diseases such as um, cancer, infectious diseases, and also well, HIV and Ebola, but they also have um, um, an emerging um, animal disease um, research work as well. 
I represent Spectrum Healthcare Partners, which is a Maine-based uh, multi-specialty uh, physician practice group that's an independent practice group um, led and um, owned by those physicians. And I also represent Unum, obviously right here in Maine, a leader in uh, affordable access to disability life, accident, other uh, lines of insurance. And you'll be hearing more from um, Laura Kilmartin later on. So thank you for your time. I look forward to working with you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so the next folks I have on the list are uh, Charlie Sultan and James Bass, Kevin Lewis, um, Kate Endy, and then Deborah Hart. Um, and I see Charlie has joined us. Mr. Sultan, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee. I am Charlie Sultan. I'm an attorney here in Augusta, and along with my partner, James Bass, will be in front of you um, on almost all issues. So I'm not going to go through the, the uh, nearly you know, nine to dozen clients that we have uh, before you, but they represent insurance of all types, uh, physicians, healthcare, uh, yeah, you know, medical malpractice stuff, all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I guess what I'd like to do is a little something different um, I've had the honor of being before this committee for 34 years and working in, uh, you know, policy with you and your uh, predecessors. Um, and so I have a huge respect for the main legislative process and policymaking um, is, a, is a really fascinating um, work uh, from your end, from our end, um, trying to make sausage out of some very complex issues. And your committee deals with some of the hardest that comes before the committee. Um, and so I just like to encourage you um, that as we go through this, that uh, one, you, as most of you do, keep an open mind. Um, some of us are gonna present ideas and issues you may not like. Um, so you can challenge us. I hope you do it um, civilly, because uh, sometimes emotions do get out of hand. Uh, we need to be um, you know, at this effort over the next six months or longer um, to try and make the best policy that can be had for um, all the people of Maine. Um, and that's what we are all in here doing together. So that's what I'd just like to encourage. Um, you know, it's, it's a great honor to work with you and I look forward to getting to meet you uh, more. Um, and so hopefully we can have individual calls in the near future. So thanks and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Sultan. Nice to see you. Um, Mr. Lewis, you are next. Hi, good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Kepler, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Kevin Lewis. I'm the president and CEO of Community Health Options, the only nonprofit health plan domiciled here in Maine. We are in our 10th year of existence and eighth year of operations, believe it or not. Uh, we are the only carrier that has been on the health insurance marketplace here in Maine every year since 2014. Our mission is to partner with businesses, with members and health professionals to provide affordable, high quality benefits that promote health and well-being. We have grown over the years, as some of you know, and we now provide coverage in the large group, small group and individual markets. And we just recently launched our Pioneer ASO, the self-insured product uh, for Maine employers looking for a local solution that still has all the sophistication in full-scale management of their healthcare spend. We employ 160 people who are all in Maine and stretch across the state from York County to Aroostook County, with most of us living within 30 miles of Lewiston, Auburn, and I myself am a proud resident of Winthrop. Over the years, we have insourced our management functions in support of our mission. This includes care management, complex care management, behavioral health care management integration, pharmacy, uh, claims adjudication, and of course, member services. Our coverage solutions provide novel approaches, um, such as uh, the first three office visits for behavioral health at no cost in many of our plans. Um, and we offer the chronic illness support program, which I can get into more details in another time. I'm pleased to note uh, that Kim Cook of Government Strategies uh, represents community health options in the legislature as well. And you'll be seeing and hearing from both of us and particularly from her on our issues of interest, uh, which typically are bills that impact healthcare costs, population health, 
health insurers, access to coverage, reinsurance, market dynamics, and reform. So looking forward to working with all of you and thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. All right. Um, next we have uh, Kate Andy, um, followed by Deb Hart, um, Sam Hallemeyer, and then Vivian McHale. Go ahead, Ms. Endy. All right. Thank you, Senator Sanborn, uh, Representative, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee um, for this opportunity to introduce myself on behalf of Consumers for Affordable Healthcare, or CAKE, as we often like to refer to ourselves. Uh, my name is Kate Endy, and I am the Policy Director at CAKE. Uh, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, that has advocated the right to quality, affordable health care for all people in Maine for the past 32 years. Um, so while you will be hearing from me uh, around issues concerning health insurance and access to affordable health care and prescription drugs, our policy work is only, you know, one small part of what we do. Uh, as designated by Maine Attorney General and Bureau of Insurance, CAKE serves as Maine's Consumer Assistance Program for Health Insurance. And as such, we operate a toll-free confidential helpline uh, staffed by experts in eligibility and enrollment in private and public health coverage, including uh, marketplace health plans. And we assist with other issues uh, regarding using insurance and accessing care, including helping people file complaints or appeal coverage denials. Uh, we also serve as the ombudsman program for Maine's Medicaid program, Maine Care, uh, and, and so help also help people uh, apply for and navigate the enrollment process for Maine Care coverage. Uh, so please certainly do not hesitate to call or refer your constituents uh, with questions about health care coverage to our helpline at 1-800-965-7476. Um, over the past year, our, we have seen an unprecedented and new demand for help with accessing private insurance. Uh, the pandemic, uh, which has also spurred an economic disruption on a massive scale, has caused thousands of Mainers to lose their employer-based coverage and experience changes in income, um, all amidst you know, a public health crisis. Uh, and so in 2020, uh, our helpline actually fielded a record number of calls uh, exceeding eight and a half thousand uh, calls and emails from people throughout the state, um, which was quite a, an increase from previous years. Thank you, Ms. Endy. We appreciate that and we look forward to hearing from you more as we proceed. Thanks. Um, Ms. Hart, you are next and you're welcome to turn your video on. I don't know why my video isn't on. Okay. Um, anyway, in the interest of time, I apologize. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, my name is Deborah Hart. I've been lobbying in front of the Maine legislature for 35 years now. So I'm right up there with Bruce Garrity and Charlie Sultan. Good company. Um, I own Hart Public Policy and I represent Hannaford Supermarkets. They have 57 retail pharmacy stores in the state of Maine, 57 pharmacies. I also represent the Retail Association of Maine and they also have independent pharmacies and the chain pharmacies included within them. One of the issues that we're very interested in is provider status for pharmacists. They certainly during this pandemic have stepped up in a very large way. And that's been an ongoing issue that we want to address. I do some work for a um, private insurance company on the PNC lines. So I'll also be um, monitoring that for you. Um, I hope that Representative Tepler doesn't even need to pick up her little thing because I am done. Thank I you, Ms. Hart. With you all. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, the next folks on our list are Sam Hollemeyer, followed by Vivian McHale, Dan Colacino, Orsino, uh, and uh, Laura Harper. And um, with that, Sam, uh, Mr. Hollemeyer, go ahead. Good morning, Chairwoman Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee. My name is Sam Hollemeyer, and I'm Director of State Affairs with the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, or PCMA, as we're known as. Um, I work primarily in the New England region, including Maine. PCMA represents the nation's pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, which you'll hear me refer to throughout this introduction, as well as this legislative session. I wanna thank you for taking the time today to introduce myself and the PBM industry, whom I've worked for and advocated for my whole career. I joke that PBMs are one of the biggest companies you've probably never heard of, largely operating as business to, um, largely operating as businesses marketing to other businesses, 
until lately where drug prices have been a uh, talking point at the state and federal level. PBMs are a healthcare company that contracts with insurance carriers, employers, and government programs to administer the prescription drug portion of the healthcare benefit. Just like you have your dental be benefit, your vision benefit, prescriptions are its own part of the healthcare system. To put it simply, PBMs exist for a reason. They're the only entity in the drug supply chain with the sole purpose of putting downward pressure on the cost of covering prescription drugs. None of the clients that I've mentioned previously actually have to use a PBM, but PBMs can save somewhere between 40 and 50% off the costs of unmanaged prescription drug plans by using various PBM tools. As you all know, the coronavirus pandemic is something that we have never seen before and it changed everyone's lives and continues to do so as we're doing that now so on the Zoom. PBMs and our clients stepped up to the challenge to make sure that all the patients we have are cared for. We worked with regulators and government, governor's emergency orders to adhere to their changes. We proactively reached out to those same entities to work with them as we are industry experts. I wanna thank you all for your time today and I look forward to working with you on this legislative session. And I'd also like to offer a PBM 101 where I can dive deeper into our industry and share some of the tools that we use to drive down costs. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, the next uh, person on the list is Vivian McHale. Um, so Vivian, go ahead. Ms. McHale, go ahead. Good morning, Senator, Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Vivian McHale. I am a lawyer and lobbyist with the firm Drummond Woodsum in Portland. Um, I live in Topsom and Representative Tepler has been my representative for just about um, every minute of my life here as a transition Mainer from DC. Um, you'll hear from me and some of my colleagues primarily on behalf of two clients this session, the American Heart Association. So I am here today um, in Allison Perron uh, Dragstead. We are newly representing the Heart Association and very pleased to be doing so. Their uh, priorities that are relevant to your committee are access to care, meaning high quality, affordable care, including cardiac and stroke care and prevention to avoid adverse outcomes in those health buckets. Quality systems of care, including tele-CPR and stroke response, which of course then uh, includes telehealth, which is a big push this uh, session for a lot of reasons, obviously, tobacco prevention and cessation and healthy kid initiatives. Um, in addition to Ms. Prone Drag, who you may hear from, you might also hear from my colleague, Toby McGrath from Drummond for the Heart Association. Um, and you'll hear, you'll see me again on behalf of State Farm, um, where I worked with some of you last session for State Farm, which is the largest offer um, insurance provider of uh, property and casualty auto insurance in the country and in Maine. And in addition to PNC, State Farm also offers life insurance, long-term disability, short-term disability, hospital confinement, indemnity, Medicare supplement, and pet insurance, which we'll be talking about this session, I see from Senator Sanborn's bill. Um, and also on behalf of State Farm, you may hear from my colleague, Adam Cody. So thanks so much for this opportunity and for all your hard work. And I look forward to working with you. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. McHale. Um, Mr. Colasino is next, um, followed by Laura Harper, Hillary Schneider, and Peter Gore. Mr. Colasino, who I probably butchered your last name several times, go ahead. No, oh, either way is fine. If you're my grandmother's hometown, it's Colasino. If you're from if you're from upstate New York, it's Colasino. So it depends where you're. <laughs> uh, good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tapler, members of the committee. My name is Dan Colasino. I am the vice chair. I'm the vice president and chairman of the Maine Association of Health Underwriters. I'm also a licensed agent and a continuing education provider. Our members represent agents and brokers who work with health plans, both insured and self-funded um, with employers and also with individuals. We will be submitting comments on any bill that relates to health insurance, prescription drugs, dental insurance, vision insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance. Our particular focus this particular session is gonna be on any bills they may impact the, the implementation of Maine's own health insurance exchange, CoverMe.gov. Uh, we'll be looking forward to, to help working with the committee, which we already are, on implementing that particular program. We also are very interested in any bills that would impact the proposed merger of the individual and the group insurance markets. Uh, with that, I'll thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you this session. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Colosino. Uh, 
Ms. Harper is next, followed by Hillary Schneider, Peter Gore, and Leslie Olette Todd. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sanborn, Representative Templer, and members of the committee. My name is Laura Harper. I'm a resident of Hollowell. I'm a senior associate at Moose Ridge Associates. We are a small and scrappy lobbying firm located out of Hollowell. I'm today on behalf of, I'm here today on behalf of my client, the Maine Association of Physicians Assistants, or MEPA. MEPA is a nonprofit corporation incorporated in 1977. We represent the physician assistants or PAs employed within Maine, and our primary objective is to enhance quality medical care to Mainers. We seek to do this through a process of continuing medical education to our membership, other healthcare workers, and the general public. And besides continuing, med continuing medical education, our priorities are to educate the public and other healthcare workers regarding the role of the physician assistant, to provide a forum where physician assistants can meet and share experiences, concerns, and plan for the future, and to propose and further legislation which affects the evolution of the physician assistant as a healthcare provider. So whenever there's legislation before you that may impact PAs, how they deliver care, how they're regulated, or an op opportunity for PAs to increase patient access to quality, affordable healthcare, you're likely to hear from me. And I would just encourage you to feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions or concerns relating to PAs, or if you'd like to meet a PA who's serving your community. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Harper and Ms. Schneider. Good morning, Senator Sanborn and Representative Tepler and members of the committee. My name is Hillary Schneider uh, and I'm the main director of government relations for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, also known as ACS CAN. I'm also um, currently serving in the roles of remote learning teacher, food and nutrition director and dog trainer. So hopefully my temporary new coworkers will not be too disruptive this session. Um, ACS CAN, uh, we empower advocates across the country to make their voices heard and influence public policy, legislative and regulatory changes to reduce the cancer burden uh, here in Maine. We're the American Cancer Society's nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy affiliate, uh, and we believe we are critical to the fight for a world without cancer. Uh, you likely are aware of the devastating impacts that cancer has on Maine individuals and families and people across this nation as few people have not been impacted by the disease. Uh, but to put it in terms of numbers, in 2021, more than 10,000 Mainers are expected to be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, that's about 30 people diagnosed every day uh, and equivalent to about the population um, of Kittery. Uh, and more than 3,300 uh, Mainers are expected to die from cancer in 2021. We uh, believe that public policy solutions are incredibly important in the fight against cancer, as we can have all the advancements in the world in treatment, early detection, but uh, if people don't have access to those treatments, uh, it's not gonna be helpful to them. So we will be here in front of you largely on private insurance matters as they pertain to patients and ensuring patients have access to adequate, affordable quality health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. Um, the next folks on the list are Mr. Gore, Leslie Alette Todd, um, and Sarah Vanderwood, um, followed by uh, Chris Pinkham. Um, so with that, Mr. Gore, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Representative Sanborn and Representative Kepler and members of the Joint Standing Committee. My name is Peter Gore. I serve as the Executive Vice President of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. I grew up in South Portland, a graduate of the University of Maine, and I currently reside in Brunswick, where Representative Harford is my representative in Augusta. Um, I um, appear before you representing the state's largest statewide business association. The chamber is over 100 years old. And together with independent local chambers of commerce, we represent a coalition of more than 5,000 businesses that include the state's largest employers, as well as the state's smallest employers who are commercially insured, as well as commercials who are self-insured. Uh, employers who are self-insured. They come from every geographic part of the state and they represent every economic sector in the state of Maine. Um, I've been a lobbyist for 30 years, five of those, with, uh, 31 years, excuse me, five of those with the Maine Department of Human Services and 26 of those with the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, I will be appearing before you on bills that impact uh, health insurance and health insurance costs for businesses. Um, as many of you know, rising healthcare costs remain one of the most significant issues for businesses of all sizes, but particularly small businesses in the state. Providing such coverage is important for small businesses and for recruitment and retention purposes, but also because many business owners feel they have a social and a moral obligation to try, to try and provide such coverage as increasingly difficult as it is to do so. Um, I hope our input will be helpful to you and we look forward to working with you on behalf of Maine people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Um, next up, I have uh, Ms. Ouellette. Good morning, committee members. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Leslie Willette Todd and I am a resident of Kennebunk. I am also a registered dietitian and owner of Nourish Lifestyles, which is a group of registered dietitians that conduct uh, both individual and group nutrition counseling services. Currently we're providing telehealth services obviously during the pandemic. And I'm also adjunct faculty at the University of New England. Uh, my capacity today is actually as the state representative for the Maine Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The academy is comprised of over 300 dietitians and dietetic technicians throughout the state of Maine. Our members provide accurate, reliable, scientific, evidence-based nutrition information and services to Maine residents. Our organization is volunteer managed, and to my knowledge, I don't believe we've had the privilege to provide testimony to your committee just yet. Um, as the state policy representative, I'm charged with monitoring legislation and um, reporting back to our public policy panel, those pieces that relate to nutrition care, and nutrition education, food security, and insurance reimbursement. In Maine, registered dietitians and dietetic technicians are the only nutrition professionals recognized by the state licensure board, um, which helps ensure that our citizens receive quality nutrition advice and care. Uh, MAND members work in clinical, business management, public health, food service, education, and entrepreneurial capacities. Um, and we adhere to national and state continuing education requirements to ensure that our professional standards are met. I just wanna share one success story with you that members have shared with me during this pandemic. Due to increased telehealth services and reimbursement, we have increased our access to care to residents across the state of Maine. Our hospital associated outpatient dietitians who serve primarily Maine care participants have seen decrease in cancellation and no-show rates, as well as decreased cost of travel. We're so excited to be able to provide um, and serve your committee as a resource for accurate scientific nutrition, food, and health information. And I just need to call out uh, Representative Tepler. Um, my brother is Chris Willett. Uh, I think he's your neighbor and he wanted me to say hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Please give um, blood my best. Thank you. <laughs> Maine is one big small town as uh, Senator King said on 60 Minutes recently. Um, so, uh, next, we have um, Sarah Vanderwood, followed by Chris Pinkham, and then Christine Austinfort and Mike McClellan will be the next up. Um, so with that, we'll hear from Ms. Vanderwood. Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the committee. It's nice to see you again, if only virtually. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Vanderwood. I'm a resident of Oxford, and I'm a government affairs consultant with Main Street Solutions. And Main Street Solutions is the government affairs public relations arm of Verrill Law Firm, which is located in Portland. We're a six member lobby team who represent a broad range of clients on issues before the legislature. Uh, but for your purposes, I'll most, of, I'll most often be in front of this committee on behalf of Massachusetts based Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, which is a not, not for profit regional health insurance company with offices in Portland. But from time to time, I may also speak to you on various issues for uh, AHIP, which is America's Health Insurance Plans, AARP, Intermed, the University of New England, Turo, AAA, and the Maine Met Veterinary Medical Association. So again, I thank you for your time and I look forward to meeting some of you and working with you all in the coming months. Thanks. Um, next up is Mr. Pinkham. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Um, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, members of the committee. My name is Chris Pinkham. I'm a resident of Freeport. 
And I too am part of that uh, 40, uh, 40 year, four decade club. Um, during the session, uh, we'll be uh, presenting um, our 29 uh, retail main banks. And I will be joined, or actually I will join Kathy Ken Boris, our Vice President of Government Affairs um, before you on a number of issues. We'll also have occasion to use um, James Bass and Charles Sultan uh, to um, be available to you. In Maine, there are 29 retail banks. There are 9,000 Mainers who work in banks. And we have 454 branch locations, most of which at this point in time are still closed, um, appointment only. And we as an industry have struggled over the last 10 months as have most industries uh, with the pandemic. Um, I'm pleased to report though that we're back in the middle of pushing out PPP loans. Um, there were nearly 24,000 that were done in the first wave and early reports are uh, that the numbers are significant this time around. This is our way of trying to help the community and uh, move money uh, into industries and businesses that need help. Uh, we'll be focused on a number of issues this year, anything related to the main economy. Uh, we certainly have been involved in monitoring the main climate council work um, the governor's economic recovery plan, all of those issues bring legislation before you. The one offer I would make to each of you is that if you have constituents that have questions about banking matters or have concerns about service they're getting, please feel free to reach out to Kathy or myself and we'll be happy to give you uh, contacts and assistance for that. Other than that, I look forward to working with all of you during the session and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so next up, we're going to hear from uh, Christine Ossenfort, followed by Mike McClellan, followed by Robert Caverly, and then Mallory Shaughnessy. Um, go ahead, Ms. Ossenfort. Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and members of the Health Coverage Insurance and Financial Services Committee. My name is Christine Ossenfort. I am the Director of Government Relations for Anthem Health Plans of Maine, better known as Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Um, we are a domestic health insurer, which means we are organized and existing under the laws of the state of Maine and regulated um, by the Bureau of Insurance. Um, we are located in South Portland, where we have nearly 700 employees in the state. Prior to the pandemic, about half of our employees were in the office and half were working from home. Um, now we are pretty much all working from home. We insure or administer health insurance coverage for approximately 230,000 Mainers. Um, I have been appearing before this committee for 25 years. Um, I've been with Anthem for 12 years now as of Tuesday. Um, I am a resident of Portland and a constituent of Senator Sanborn. I grew up in the Belfast area um, and have been working in health insurance issues for about 20 of those 25 years that I've been appearing at the legislature. So thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce myself. I look forward to working with you. And above all, um, I wanna be a resource for you as I have seen this issue from a number of different perspectives and through a number of different changes over the years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ossenfort. Uh, next up, we have Mr. McClellan. You're on mute. Okay, there we go. Well, good go. morning, Senator Sanborn and Representative Tepler and committee members. Uh, I am Mike McClellan. I'm the policy director for the Christian Civic League of Maine. Uh, Carol Connolly is our executive director. He might also testify at times. Uh, some information for new legislators. Uh, I'm a former member of this committee, and there's a historical um, process where I'm supposed to bring treats to you today as I'm testifying. I haven't figured out how to do that on Zoom. So I will owe you guys a treat the first time I get to come before you. Uh, the Christian Civic League is a 125 plus year old main organization. We're a C3 and a C4 um, group. We um, have in the past been involved with things like prohibition, uh, helping women's right to vote, things like that. Been, been around a long time. Uh, we're totally funded by main people, individuals, and by churches who agree with our mission. Uh, this is my fifth year, which I guess makes me young. Uh, concerns with this committee uh, in the past for us, and it's been kind of recent, uh, back when I was on, it seemed like you did a lot more just insurance stuff, but 
Um, we were involved in the last few years with life issues, uh, some of the abortion issues, the assisted suicide issue. We're involved with family issues. We've been involved with gender issues. And uh, the last couple of years, we've really worked at working with people in the community to get them to come and testify. So that's a focus we're uh, kind of pushing as well. So um, I know what you guys are going through and I thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. McClellan. Um, so we are gonna hear from uh, Mr. Caverly and then Ms. Shaughnessy, and then we're gonna just take about a five minute break. Uh, we're gonna swap um, the timer role and the chair role um, briefly here uh, coming up, um, but we are making good progress through our list um, this morning. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Caverly. Thank you, Senator Sanborn, uh, Representative Templer, uh, members of the committee. My name is Robert Caverly, and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Maine Credit Union League. Uh, the league represents all of Maine's uh, 54 credit unions, uh, which employ about 2,300 Mainers. Um, and our credit unions have a little over 728,000 Mainers as uh, members of their credit union, uh, representing about 9.6 billion in total assets. Um, as Many have referenced, uh, there's been a lot of challenges uh, during the pandemic, um, and uh, I'm proud to report that uh, all of Maine's credit unions have done something uh, to uh, help their members uh, address those economic challenges, whether that was offering, you know, the federal government's BPP loan, or internally um, doing skip a pays loan restructuring, refinancing, forbearances, and what have you. Um, we also uh, contract with uh, Ed and Kate Pino. They'll be uh, before the committee um, from time to time for us. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you this session. So uh, good luck and uh, great to see everybody. Thank you, Mr. Caverly. Ms. Shaughnessy. Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mallory Shaughnessy and I'm a resident of Westbrook and the executive director of the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services. I'm honored to say that I'm also very ably represented by Senator uh, Sanborn. Um, with 35 members, the Alliance represents the majority of Maine's licensed safety net community-based mental health and substance use treatment agencies. Our member agencies employ nearly 6,000 Maine people who provide treatment and services to nearly 100,000 uh, Maine men, women, and children. The Alliance advocates for implementation of policies and practices that serve to enhance the quality and effectiveness of our behavioral health care system. Uh, as you can see from the handout that I sent in advance, hopefully you have it, um, our mission is to uh, advance treatment and recovery-oriented systems of care for Mainers that are experiencing mental health and substance use challenges through advocacy, leadership, collaboration, and professional development. Uh, it is our vision that at some point uh, in the near future, um, the behavioral health care needs of all Mainers will be met uh, with the highest quality and most compassionate care available in the most appropriate environment. Uh, I personally live in a four generation um, growing farmstead in, in this age of COVID may sometimes experience Zoom bombing uh, from grandchildren or uh, background noises from adjacent rooms. Uh, please accept my apologies in advance. Um, I might even take you off for a tour of the goats at some point in the spring when we have babies. <laughs> um, uh, but as you can see, you, you will see me um, sometimes before you in relation to bills that impact health insurance uh, and in working to reduce barriers to healthcare access. Um, please know you can also call on me at any time to provide any kind of feedback if you have questions or interest in information on the impacts of proposed legislation on the behavioral health safety net in Maine. Um, I do look forward to working with all of you. Um, we've all been under you know, severe challenges and I thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Ms. Shaughnessy. So with that, we are going to take a five minute break. Um, and I would just encourage our um, committee members to turn off their video and mute their microphone while we're on break. Um, and for those watching us um, or following along, uh, you can expect us to be back live at around 1110. Um, and uh, to complete the rest of our introductions from our interested parties at that time. Thanks.
Christian, if you want to pull um, uh, Ms. Kilmartin, Mr. Chanhook, and Ms. Conley in, then we can get started back up soon. And Great. Representative Tepler, I'll let Thank you drive, you and I will do the timing. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Maybe you are still muted for some reason, or maybe your microphone's not working. Maybe that's why I couldn't hear you. Hmm. I'm just looking to see. Phooey. <sighs> yeah, we can't hear you. I can hear. I can hear. Yes, we can. Good. It's uh, okay, good. Good. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Could, could folks tell me if they heard the um the ringing of the timer? No, no, never did. Never heard it. All right, that's crazy, but okay. What I have a sense that may happen with my timer as well because I'm using my headphones microphone. So I'm gonna give it a try, but I will um, similarly to um, uh, Representative Tepler, I'll be using my uh, phone and I'll just stick it up in the, um, screen and hopefully folks will be able to see it. Everybody's been so respectful so far of our two minute timing. We really appreciate it. And we're gonna get through these um, introductions um, within about an hour, uh, another hour this morning. So it should be great. All Absolutely. right, Thank go you. ahead. Thank you. So um, next up is um, Laura Kilmartin. Please go ahead, Ms. Kilmartin. Great, thank you. Good morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and, and the members of the committee. My name is Laura Kilmartin. I'm a resident of Westbrook, and I'm Assistant Vice President of Government Affairs for UNUM. So thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself this morning. UNUM's had a presence in Maine since 1881, and we currently employ more than 2,800 people in Maine. Almost 90% of Maine's of UNUM's Maine workers are based at the company's Portland home office, but in, since last March, as you can probably see, most of us have been working virtually and remotely. Um, hopefully you've all heard of UNUM, but you may not know exactly what we do. So we offer financial protection to employees through their employers, and that includes an array of insurance products such as life, disability, accident, critical illness, paid family and medical leave, dental and vision benefits, and we also offer multiple services directly to employers, such as absence management, vocational rehabilitation services, and enrollment services. And in addition to introducing myself, I wanna make myself available as a resource. If any of you have any questions about the products or the services we offer, wanna understand any of our processes or our practices better, please just let me know. I'd be happy to provide you with information or connect you with one of UNUM's subject matter experts. And I thank you again for your time this morning. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Kilmartin. And next up is Mr. Benjamin Chandok. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. You got it, yeah, Chandok. Thank you so much and uh, good morning, Representative Tepler and Senator Sanborn and members of the committee. And thanks for holding this meeting and allowing me to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ben Chandok, I'm the Eastern Region State Government Affairs Director for BIO, uh, who's the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. So we're the world's largest trade association representing biotechnology companies, academic institutions, state biotechnology centers, and other related organizations. Uh, you know, our members, share a commitment to uh, discover and develop innovative medicines and uh, work to improve the lives of patients. And you'll be hearing from me on uh, issues relating to biopharmaceuticals and health insurance matters, but uh, I also just like to offer bio as a resource um, for any life science related issues, such as updates on COVID-19 vaccine development or the development of therapies to treat COVID-19. We've done those in uh, quite a few states uh, so far. And if we could ever be helpful, please let us know. Uh, Bio is also represented by Mark Gallagher. So I think you'll be hearing from him uh, later this morning. So uh, in any case, I'm very much looking forward to working together. Uh, and I hope I finish before two minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chandok. And uh, we do appreciate the, the brevity that most people are giving us. Um, thank you so much. And next up is Ms. Kate Conley. Ms. Conley, please go ahead. You're muted. 
Nope, there we go. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Kate Conley. I'm an attorney with Ratchford Law Group. Um, I'm a Maine native, originally from Bath, but I now live and work in Portland, um, and I'm a constituent of Senator Sanborn. Um, I was admitted to practice in 2005, and since that time, my practice has in large part been uh, commercial and consumer debt collection. Uh, the types of matters that I will be appearing on before the committee are those uh, touching on the regulation of debt collection and creditors' rights. Um, I'll be representing myself and my firm, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself this morning, and I look forward to working with all of you, and I hope I can be a resource if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conley. And Mr. Austin, welcome. Good morning. My name is Jeff Austin. I'm the lobbyist for the Maine Hospital Association. I've been a lobbyist for 18 years, 10 of which have been with the Hospital Association. Uh, I am a resident of Brunswick. MHA represents all 36 hospitals in the state of Maine, the 36 private hospitals. There are two state psychiatric hospitals that are not members of ours. Um, we represent the administrative side of the house. Uh, so while hospitals employ the majority of doctors and nurses in the state, uh, they have very adequate representation from their associations. And so on clinical issues, we tend not to take a leadership role, but on administrative issues, which are a lot of what you deal with, billing, insurance, those matters, uh, we do appear before you quite regularly. Um, so when I speak and say that the hospitals in Maine uh, have a particular position, it is the CEOs, CFOs that uh, have provided me that uh, guidance. We, there's no such thing as a normal year in our world, um, whether it's implementation of the ACA or Medicaid expansion or vaccination referendums. There's no such thing as normal, uh, but this year has just taken the cake. It has been insanity. And we are very proud at the Hospital Association that much of Maine's success in uh, trying to manage this has been the work of our members. Uh, there is not much of a public health infrastructure in the state of Maine and much of it has fallen to them. So uh, I'm the guy who sent you this uh, publication over the fall. I hope you received it. That was the introduction to our issues and please don't hesitate to reach out at any time during the session if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Austin. And coming up, we have next Mr. Royce, and then Ed and Kate Pineau, and then Mr. Frank D'Alessandro. Um, so Mr. Royce, uh, if you'll turn on your video and unmute, please join us. Mr. Royce, you're still muted and not on video. Oh, nope, that's Frank. Are we okay now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Can't see you yet, but I can hear you. Well, that's the important thing, I guess. Uh, Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepla, members of the committee. My name is John Royce and I'm a resident of the city of Augusta. I represent the Maine Chiropractic Association, and I have represented the association uh, for many years now. I will have several issues before the committee, this legislative session, and I look forward to working with all of you, and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Royce. Um, and next up we have um, Ed and Kate Pineau. Welcome. Thank you, Representative Tefler and Senator and all of the rest of you. Um, we cannot believe that the sun just came out and illuminated us to this degree. So I hope you can see us. Yeah, just so you know, on a serious base, Kate was going to let me talk, but she took off, of course. Yeah. Uh, we represent both well, the contract lobbyists for the credit unions. We also represent the funeral directors that will be in front of you. We I represent a generic drug manufacturer, and we also represent Centene, which does Medicaid and Medicare programs. Uh, I've been around since 88. I served in the House, uh, actually chaired this committee, uh, didn't learn anything, so therefore I became a lobbyist to be in front of you. I want to thank you for your service. If you have any questions, we're here. We've been around forever, uh, and good luck to you in this session. 
It's going to be totally different. Good luck to you all. Thank you very much, Pinoz. Nice to see you. Um, next up is Mr. Frank D'Alessandro, but after Mr. D'Alessandro, we'll be hearing from Tom Stern, a board member of Maine All Care, Amanda Richards, and Holly Lusk. So um, Mr. D'Alessandro, please take it away. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Templer, Senator Sanborn, and members of the Joint Standing Committee for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Frank D'Alessandro. I'm the Litigation and Policy Director of Maine Equal Justice. We're a civil legal services organization and we work with and for people with low income seeking solutions to poverty through policy, education, and legal representation. Um, the bill, I'll try to be as brief as possible. The bills that you're likely to see us on, uh, we do a lot of work around uh, debt collection issues and regulation of debt buyers. Um, and then also we do a lot of work around healthcare issues. Um, I'll be the one primarily in front of you around debt collection and consumer issues. Um, Kathy Kilrain Del Rio of our office will be primarily around um, and discussing healthcare issues with you. Um, we look forward to working with you and everyone on the committee. And if we can be a resource, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. D'Alessandro. And next, um, Mr. Stern, please go ahead. You're muted still, Mr. Stern. Better? Yes, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, good morning to both Senator Sanborn, Representative Tepler, and the members of the committee. As you've heard, my name is Tom Stern. I'm a retired primary care physician, community health center director, and graduate of Harvard Medical School and the London School of Economics. I sit on the board of directors of Maine All Care, and I'm old enough to benefit from the most administratively lean program in the country, which is Medicare. The COVID pandemic has yet further highlighted the really glaring deficiencies in our healthcare financing and delivery system here in Maine. Care has been beyond both financial and geographic reach for vast swaths of our population. Administrative costs consume nearly a quarter of every healthcare dollar contributed, and the prices for medicines and goods outstrip those in all other industrial nations. Profit motivates the provision of services here when healthcare should be considered a human right, and efforts to mitigate these problems have fallen sorely short of achieving really measurable improvements. We therefore support transformational changes. We've watched this committee tackle these monumental problems around the edges with high hopes, but marginal success. Mainers continue to face co-pays and deductibles, which effectively block access, no matter what their premiums are, and ongoing exorbitant medication prices. Networks do not allow full and free access to the providers of their choice. Professionals and institutions are hobbled by burdens, and there is a better and less expensive way. What is it that we really want? I assert that we want universal, universal, usable coverage for all Maine residents, affordable and, uh, and delivered in a way that there will, Mainers will not be at risk of insolvency to achieve it. Sophisticated economic analyses here show that in Maine, a simple publicly funded, privately provided coverage plan can provide comprehensive benefits from everyone and reduce costs. We ask for your courage and will, the people's representatives to advocate for such, and at Maine All Care, we'll continue our work with you and all the residents to share information and support this most human of human goals. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I misrepresented you initially. Um, and next um, up is um, Amanda Richards from the Osteopathic Association. Ms. Richards. Good morning, uh, Representative Tupler and Senator Sanmore and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Amanda Richards, and I serve as the executive director of the Maine Osteopathic Association. I'm also a resident of Topsom, uh, recently moved in into Ms. Tepler's neighborhood, um, and we sometimes pass each other on walks, so that's really fun. Um, the Maine Osteopathic Association, or MOA as we're known, is a professional organization representing approximately 400 practicing osteopathic physicians, or DOs as they are known, as well as, as an additional 700 plus residents and students undergoing their medical training in Maine. 
Our mission includes advocating for the availability of quality osteopathic health care to the people of the state. Uh, our offices are located in Manchester, but of course our members serve patients throughout the state of Maine. For those of you who may not be familiar, DOs are fully licensed physicians who practice in every medical specialty. Roughly one in five Maine physicians is a DO. And osteopathic medicine is one of the fastest growing healthcare professions in the country with one out of every four medical students in the country enrolled in an osteopathic medical school. Uh, Maine's medical school, the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine is accredited for 165 students per year and is located in Biddeford. Uh, it's been a consistent provider of Maine's rural doctors in Maine. Um, DOs are formally trained in a unique form of manipulative therapy called ONT, a hands-on treatment that has been shown to ease pain, promote healing, and increase overall mobility. Uh, more than one-third of MOA members are in private practice medicine, so that is a concern of ours, uh, the issues that are unique to independent physicians. Um, we support patient access to physician-led care, evidence-based medical practice, and equity within the healthcare system. We also work closely with James Bass and Charlie Sultan, uh, and we all look forward to speaking with you and helping the committee with their work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Richards. Um, next up will be um, Ms. Lusk, but following Ms. Lusk will be Stephen Butterfield with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Pam O'Sullivan, and then Jim Mitchell and Chris Jackson from Mitchell Tardy Jackson. All right, so Ms. Lusk, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am a lawyer. I uh, live in Harpswell. I practice administrative law before the agencies of the state of Maine. Uh, this time of year, most of my time is spent uh, lobbying. So I anticipate appearing in front of you um, representing a couple of different clients in the healthcare space. Uh, the first is Synovian Pharmaceuticals, um, which is a Massachusetts-based company which focuses its research and development uh, in the treatment of a few different areas, um, psychiatric, neurological, and respiratory conditions, um, specifically some of those very difficult to treat um, psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. In the neurological space, they focus on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So their interests are primarily in ensuring that uh, patients have access to the right medications at the right time without a lot of paperwork. Um, and so that's what I'll be doing for them. Um, I also anticipate appearing in front of you on behalf of Fresenius Medical Care. Fresenius operates um, close to 20 dialysis clinics across the state of Maine, from Eastport to York County to Wilton. Uh, those clinics have stayed open during the pandemic because obviously they provide a life-saving treatment. Um, we have been treating COVID positive patients in isolation at those clinics. And our staff has uh, just been, uh, begun getting uh, the Moderna vaccine. So if you have any questions about that process, we're happy to, um, to help share. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lusk. And um, I guess Pam O'Sullivan is not available. So um, next up is Steve Butterfield and following Mr. Butterfield, Jim Mitchell and Chris Jackson. So uh, Mr. Butterfield, please. Yeah, good morning, uh, chairs and members. Everyone can hear me? Good to go. Um, boy, you're going to be sick of hearing that by the end of this session. Um, yeah, my name is Steve Butterfield. Um, I am the Regional Director of Government Affairs for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, which is the world's largest nonprofit uh, dedicated with a focus on blood cancers. So leukemia, lymphoma, uh, myelomas, and, and other uh, cancerous blood disorders. Um, I will primarily be appearing before you speaking about insurance issues, uh, making sure that blood cancer patients have, have access not only to affordable coverage, but coverage that meets their needs when they need those needs met. Um, for example, we're involved right now um, with the Bureau of Insurance looking at, um, you know, staying invested and involved in the process of standard plan design in the state, which was due to a bill that was passed last session. Um, so you'll be hearing about us from that um, and assorted other issues, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you do have constituents um, that you hear from who have blood cancer diagnoses or family members of blood cancer diagnoses, Outside of just the public policy work that we do, um, our organization can also assist in connecting folks with um, copay assistance programs that we offer with connection to 
information on treatment options, connection to clinical trials. Um, so certainly if you have constituents who have a blood cancer, um, have any questions or concerns about their treatment options or affording it, um, please do send them our way and we'll make sure that we get them connected to those resources as well. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Butterfield. Um, and Mr. Mitchell, please go ahead. Thank you, Representative Tepler and Senator Sanborn and members of the committee. Um, Jim Mitchell with Mitchell Tardy Jackson. Uh, Chris is gonna talk about a couple of our clients. Uh, I will say that um, before your committee, we'll have some work related to our long-term care client, First Atlantic. Most of their issues are handled over at HHS, but occasionally they appear before your committee. And then uh, we also represent the Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturers of America, best known as Pharma. Obviously, our job is to defend our client's interest, but we also hope to be a resource to the committee with timely, accurate, useful information as you deliberate the competing interests of the bills that come before you. Chris? Thanks, Jim. And uh, Representative Tepler, Senator Sanborn, members of the committee, uh, thanks for having us. Really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I am Chris Jackson. I'm a resident of Bodenham. I am a partner in the, in the firm of Mitchell Tardy Jackson Government Affairs. And as Jim mentioned, we'll be before the committee on behalf of several different clients, including uh, the ones Jim mentioned, but also uh, Maine Health, which you had already heard from this morning, and the Maine Association of Nurse Anesthetists, or MIANA, as it's called. Uh, MIANA is the trade association that represents Maine's approximately 350 certified registered nurse anesthetists, or CRNAs. CRNAs are advanced practice nurses that work in Maine's largest medical centers, but importantly, um, and this, this is important to keep in mind, are the only anesthesia providers in Maine in 20 of Maine's most rural locations. So we look forward to speaking with you, being a resource for you on their behalf this year. And thanks again for the chance to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Our next three presenters uh, in the interested parties list will be Mr. Bill Clark, Mr. Bob Howe, and Mr. Zach Lingley. Um, so Mr. Clark, if you would unmute and run your video if possible, um, please join us. Thank you, let's get the video going. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Senator Sandman, Representative Tepler, committee members. It's good to be with you in Maine's 130th. I'm a Brunswick resident, a retired primary care physician and addiction specialist, and I studied health policy at Harvard University. Medicare became law the year I finished Harvard Medical School, and I hope that everyone could have the benefits uh, we extended to our elderly citizens. After all, as Senate President Jackson forcefully says, health care is a human right. Now, 56 years later, market-based health care systems betray patients and simultaneously exasperate caregivers. Of course, insurers generate enormous profits through continuing high deductibles, limited networks, and frustrating denials of professionally ordered services. I'm a board member of a new C4 organization, Maine Healthcare Action. And in that capacity, I will help present resolve, a resolve to voters, a resolve that asks the legislature to bring publicly funded health care to everyone. The legislature would determine uh, the particulars of that legislation. Incremental modifications to the present system, such as Megara adjustments, the developing uh, a main based ACA exchange are simpler, but they continue sending heaps of profits to corporations that obstruct and limit the delivery of essential medical services to Maine people. Evidence from economic studies here in Maine confirmed that Maine could create a simpler system, one without deductibles or networks, while providing comprehensive benefits privately delivered. Maine could include every resident and reduce costs. I humbly ask, will you elected people's representatives, will you help Maine government muster the political will to forego market-based solutions and embrace and implement healthcare as a human right for your constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, and um, next, Mr. Lingley. 
Morning, Senator Sanborn, Representative Kepler, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Zach Lingley. I'm a resident of South Portland. I've been lobbying in front of the Maine legislature since 2014, and I'm the founder and principal at <clears throat> Patriot Consulting Group, which is a hybrid firm focused on capital lobbying and public affairs projects. Uh, I represent the Opportunity and Solutions Project, or national public policy organization aimed at providing pathways to lower cost, higher quality health care, uh, among other good government reforms. Previously, we've done work before the committee on <clears throat> uh, price transparency for routine medical procedures, adjustments to MIWA regulations, and uh, this session will have a focus on access to telehealth services uh, and uh, some of those good things that Governor Mills has done via executive order. Uh, I'll also be representing Bayer US, which is a national pharmaceutical and agriculture company um, focused on uh, prescription regulatory issues, drug pricing, drug take back and the general insurance issues. So many thanks to the chairs uh, and the committee for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to working with you again this session. Thank you, uh, Mr. Langley and Mr. Howe, I'm very sorry I skipped over you. You were actually supposed to come before Mr. Langley, so apologies. Um, but I also want to announce that after uh, Mr. Howe, Michelle Foster, Lisa Harvey McPherson, and Mark Gallagher will be joining us as the next three. So please, Mr. Howe, take it away. Thank you, Representative Tepler. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well in this uh, COVID era. I'm Bob Howe. I'm a resident of Representative Ralph Tucker's district in Brunswick. Um, we've, uh, had, we've got a little longevity contest going here. This is my 39th session as a lobbyist. I served and chaired this committee, although it was differently named, when Bruce Garrity began his lobbying career. <laughs> um, I'm a retired organic farmer, former director of the ACLU of Maine and longtime lobbyist. Uh, I'm a principal at Howe Cahill and Company. My partner, Pam Cahill, I think is watching and listening on YouTube. Um, we have, she, Pam has served in both the House and the Senate and as secretary of the Senate. Uh, the clients most likely to bring us before this committee this session are five healthcare professional groups, nurse practitioners, occupational therapists, licensed massage therapists, speech therapists, and uh, clinical psychologists. Two of those groups have interstate licensing compacts uh, before you this session. Our other clients are chiefs of police, campground owners, the Sierra Club, League of Women Voters, Maine Citizens of Clean Elections, Adult Education, Lee Academy, and the Arts Educators. Um, I'm married to a nurse practitioner who just got her second COVID vaccine. It was the Moderna vaccine. She works for Central Maine Healthcare as a women's health practitioner. Uh, mild reaction to the second shot. Um, and I just got a bulletin via email that Johnson & Johnson has gone into phase three trials and uh, it's showing a 95% uh, effectiveness, which is good news. Thanks, and uh, I'd say I'll see you under the dome, but probably not this year. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Howe. And next is Ms. Foster. Thanks for joining us, Ms. Foster. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Senator Sanborn and Representative Tepler and committee members. My name is Michelle Carroll Foster. I'm here on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers. Um, as Regional Vice President for State Relations. So thank you for having me this morning. I'll be brief, ACLI is the leading trade association uh, driving public policy and advocacy on behalf of the life insurance industry and its consumers. Um, our members of companies are dedicated to protecting consumers' financial well-being through not only life insurance, but annuities, retirement plans, long-term care insurance, disability income insurance, and reinsurance and as well as uh, supplemental benefits such as dental and vision plans. 
Um, specifically, we had 322 companies licensed to do business in the state of Maine and three member companies domiciled um, in the state. And I would just mention Ann Robinson, who spoke uh, a little while ago, uh, represents uh, the ACLI on matters in Maine. Um, and we look forward to working with you all on this committee and offer ourselves as a resource on all life insurance matters um, as you all take them up. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. And uh, before we hear from Ms. Harvey McPherson, I'd also like to point out that Mr. Gallagher doesn't seem to be with us. So following Ms. Harvey McPherson will be Amy Downing of the Maine Pharmacy Association. So uh, Ms. Harvey McPherson, please go ahead. Great, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm Lisa Harvey McPherson, and I am the Vice President of Northern Light Health for Government Relations. I have two documents um, that I shared with Colleen to facilitate my two minute time limit. Um, so on one document, you will see a map of our footprint. And as you travel from Portland to the Canadian border, you will see Northern Light has 10 hospital members, a statewide home care and hospice program, nursing facilities, pharmacy, air and ground ambulance, as well as uh, primary care and specialty practices. You'll also see a document that highlights our successes of 2020. And we talk a lot about our, our work supporting the needs of Maine citizens during the COVID uh, pandemic. In addition to policy, I am also a registered nurse and I have had uh, nursing experience in a variety of healthcare settings. And I think that uh, lends uh, itself well when I discuss patient care issues and patient policy issues. But I'm also the nursing uh, spokesperson for Omni Nursing Leaders of Maine. So you will see me um, working with you on a variety of nursing uh, professional matters um, before the committee. And I believe I've fulfilled my two minute time limit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey McPherson. And please forgive the phone ringing in the background. Uh, it's my house. I still haven't figured out how to uh, control my landline during these meetings. Um, there may be a way, but I haven't figured it out yet. And next up, please, we'd like to hear from last but not least, I believe, Amy Downing. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Yes, hopefully not least. Um, good, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Downing. Um, I'm the executive director for the Maine Pharmacy Association. Um, we represent um, individual pharmacists and pharmacy technicians who work for both large chains as well as independent main based pharmacies. Um, so when we come before you, we are there on behalf of the people that you see behind the counter when you go to your local pharmacy. Um, we also work very closely with both of the schools of pharmacy in Maine um, at UNE and Husson University. Um, primarily, you'll see Amelia Arnold or Dr. Kenneth McCall on our behalf um, in regards to pharmacy related issues. Um, as you can imagine, our members are very busy right now, um, but we're really proud of how they've stepped up to help in this pandemic. Um, and we look forward to working with you all this session. Thank you very much, Ms. Downing. Um, and I wanna thank all of our interested parties who participated this morning for abiding by our time limits and enabling us to finish our meeting in a very reasonable time frame. Um, and I'm wondering if we have any other comments or thoughts we need to share before we not adjourn, but pause till we reconvene for our afternoon meeting. I'll just, um, <clears throat> Representative Tepler. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. I'll just remind everyone that I think um, we are going to continue the live stream. Um, it, it'll be live. Uh, so when we rejoin for this afternoon session, you'll be connecting to the same link, uh, but you probably do want to drop off entirely of that Zoom um, during our break. Uh, here and I think the timing for the afternoon session is 1:30. Is that right? Yep. So, um, so definitely recommend to our committee members, as well as frankly to the uh, attendees who are in the Zoom, that you should um, uh, leave entirely, and we'll be back around 1:30. Thank you. And Christian, can you remind the committee whether or not it's the same link for this afternoon? 
Yes, the link you used to join this morning should be the same one for this afternoon. If you have trouble, call the committee's direct line. I'll take care of that. Thank you, Christian. All right, everybody, we'll see you later. Denise? Yeah? Hey, can you give me the direct line to the committee room, please? Christian? Oh, I can, if he's not on. Um, it's 207-287-1314. Thank you, Colleen. You're welcome. All right. Have Thank a good you very day. much. Thanks, Mark. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, thanks. Bye.
Madam Speaker. Hi, Representative Quint. You're in the HCIFS call right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Representative Kepler. I want to thank all of the DPFR staff members who are with us. The meeting will begin hopefully right on time um, as soon as we have a few more attendees. Well, it's 1.31. I'm hoping a few more of our members will be able to join us this afternoon. This is the afternoon uh, continuation of the meeting of the Health Coverage Insurance and Financial Services Committee. Um, and since um, you weren't with us this morning, um, Representative Connor, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, my name is uh, Representative John Connor from uh, House District 58, part of Lewiston. Thank you. Um, and I just want to um, mention to our clerk, um, Mr. Ritchie, that Yay. apparently Christy Matheson is having difficulty getting on the Zoom. So hopefully she will figure out in a minute. Oh, and Senator Stewart, welcome. Would you introduce yourself since you weren't with us this morning as well? Certainly, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator for District 2, 51 communities in Southern Aroostook and Northern Penobscot counties. Thank you. Thank you, and we're joined this afternoon by our analyst, um, Ms. Colleen McCarthy-Reed, and um, our clerk, Christian Ricci, and we will be speaking with the staff members of the Department of Professional and financial regulation this afternoon. Um, and we're going to begin with um, an introduction from the Deputy Commissioner, Joan Cohen, who will go over the briefing book that we received uh, from the commission, I'm sorry, from the commissioner's office. Um, and we will, um, I'm sorry, I just got a message from another member. Uh, Poppy Arford needs uh, an update on the link too. Thank you, Christian. Um, and so if we could get um, Ms. Cohen into the panelists, I see she's here. Um, and if she would like to unmute herself and get going on giving us an introduction to the department. Thanks for being here, Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much, Representative Tepler uh, and members of the HCIFS committee. Uh, my name is Joan Cohen and I am the deputy for the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation. And I would like to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about the department and to introduce ourselves to you. I am following very specific orders from your committee's analysts to keep the presentation very high level and non-substantive, uh, focusing on a general overview of our department via our briefing book, followed by a, um, introduction to each of the agency heads and their teams, and then a Q&A. Uh, without a doubt, the agency heads could speak more knowledgeably than I about each of their agencies. Uh, so in deference to them and their extensive experience, I request uh, respectfully that you hold up asking questions until the Q&A so that the subject matter experts can share their thoughts. Um, Colleen, is the briefing book up? Um, Colleen is going to yep. drive. I am. Here we go. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, this is our briefing book, a brand new thing for us this year. Um, and we distributed uh, the book to you in December um, and then have made a few adjustments to it. So I do want to make sure if you could lower just a little bit, Colleen, that when you refer to the book, um, when you use it as a resource, that you are using the January uh, edition, which we see right there. Um, there are a variety of mission statements throughout. I promise I won't be doing a lot of reading, but I do want to read DPFR's mission um, since I think that really sets the stage, uh, which is to encourage sound ethical business business practices through high quality, impartial and efficient regulation of insurers, financial institutions, creditors, and numerous professions and occupations to protect the citizens of Maine. So before turning to the next page, I'm gonna issue a challenge, which is to figure out which one of us uh, was brave enough to use a recent picture uh, from within the last decade. Uh, there will not be a quiz at the end. Uh, so next page, please. Um, this is uh, Commissioner Ann Head, uh, who, uh, according to the Law and Legislative Library, Commissioner Head is the longest serving commissioner in Maine history. She was first appointed as commissioner by Governor Baldacci in 2008. She also serves as director of the Office of Professional and Occupational Regulation, a position she's held since 1996. So she served under three governors and as, OPOR, uh, as commissioner and as OPOR director under four. And I think you're going to notice a theme as I introduce the heads of our departments and agencies of decades of service under a range of administrations. So they have lots of experience and have earned tremendous respect from the range of political perspectives. 
Very quickly, um, an overview of the department. The department consists of five agencies and a centralized administrative services division. In addition, there are six boards affiliated with the department. Throughout the briefing book, there are clickable links to agency websites, consumer resources, and contacts. Um, so I encourage you uh, at, at your leisure to uh, please um, click away and, and learn more about us. Next page, please. Oh, yep, this is me. Uh, <laughs> Um, I am the primary uh, legislative contact for the department. I have been with the department since 2019. I'm also going to serve as the primary constituent contact while the department seeks to fill that position. So please reach out to me if you have any que questions or need assistance, and I will do my best to answer or find the right subject matter expert to assist you. Uh, by way of very brief background, I'm a former state representative and was also a government relations specialist where my work focused on healthcare and workers' comp, among other issues. Uh, for those of you new legislators, I can remember that feeling of excitement and being overwhelmed. Uh, it's truly an incredible experience and honor. And since I always appreciated it, I do want to say thank you for your service to our state because that is not said enough. So thank you. A um, little bit lower, uh, we see contact information. I do encourage you to reach out to us at any time. Uh, next page, please. Our first agency is the Bureau of Consumer Credit Protection, uh, ably led by Superintendent Will Lund. Um, Superintendent Lund was first appointed in 1987. And he has served under five administrations. Uh, uh, the Bureau of Consumer Credit Protection is the state agency that regulates all aspects of mortgage uh, company lending and other financial services. Uh, their oversight includes things like non-bank mortgage uh, companies, credit reporting agency, pawn brokers, student loan servicers, just to name a few. Next page, please. So they accomplish their core regulatory functions by responding to consumer complaints. Uh, the Consumer Protection and Consumer Assistance is a key component of the Bureau's mission. And I can tell you uh, with a personal experience with identity theft, they offer tremendously excellent customer service. Uh, they regulate over 1,400 companies and individuals. Uh, they perform a variety of investigations and enforcements. And over the past five years, they've conducted well over 1,000 compliance exams, 76 disciplinary actions, and have provided restitution of over a million. Um, and they engage in extensive outreach and education. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next page, please. Um, here we're drawing your attention to some of the, their initiatives and emerging issues, uh, such as the resumption of mortgage foreclosures and student loan collections at the end of the current um, repayment forbearance. Uh, and um, among other things, the Bureau serves at the, as the state student loan ombudsman. Next page, please. So here are some examples of their extensive outreach efforts. Uh, in the past five years, the Bureau has published 10 new consumer booklets on a range of topics. And just below um, those uh, lovely covers, you can see contact information for the Bureau, including a link to their website. Uh, next page, please. So next we have the Bureau of Financial Institutions, uh, which is ably uh, run by uh, Superintendent Lloyd LaFountain. Uh, Superintendent LaFountain was appointed superintendent in 2005. He is a former member of the State House of Representatives and a four-term Maine State Senator, each of which he served as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Insurance and Financial Services. So he's clearly an experienced resource for the department and for you. Uh, B, uh, BFI regulates um, state chartered financial institutions, including commercial banks and credit unions. Uh, note they do not regulate nationally chartered banks and federally chartered credit unions. And just below, you can see uh, who those state chartered institu institutions include. Uh, next page, please. So their regulatory, um, sorry, they accomplish their regulatory function by chartering banks. Uh, when statutory criteria are satisfied by re promulgating regulations through examination and enforcement um, and uh, through legislation such as working, working to keep the banking code up to date and uh, receptive to the needs of consumers and businesses. And finally, also through consumer outreach uh, to do things like help uh, educate consumers to avoid scans, scams and to respond to complaints about um, financial institutions. Next page, please. 
Uh, so uh, here you have a snapshot of services BFI provides to businesses and consumers, um, including, as I mentioned, investigation of complaints and, and education and awareness. And below, um, you can see some of their initiatives and emerging um, issues. Uh, one of which I'll point out, which is foreclosure activity following the pandemic at the end of the moratorium. Next page, please. Um, so here's a snapshot of their education and outreach efforts. Um, they have a great focus on elder abuse prevention efforts and uh, uh, consumer publications located on their website. Uh, and just below those, uh, some of those um, uh, publications are contact information for uh, BFI and for their key contacts. Next page, please. So next we have the Bureau of Insurance who is ably uh, um, overseen by Superintendent Chapa, who you heard from the other day. Superintendent Chapa has been with the Bureau since 1988, starting as a statistician and then became super, uh, sorry, deputy superintendent in 1998. And he was first confirmed as superintendent in uh, 2011. He also recently served as president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Again, another wealth of information and experience. Uh, you, heard, uh, below, um, you heard from the Bureau who they do and don't regulate the other day, so I certainly won't go into detail, but the three major themes are insurance companies, individuals and business entities, and then uh, other entities related to insurance. Uh, next page, please. So the Bureau accomplishes its regulatory function uh, by licensing insurance companies to ensure that they remain solvent and able to pay claims uh, and uh, licensing and regulating insurance producers and other entities, uh, providing uh, consumer assistance um, to assist consumers with insurance questions and uh, complaints um, with their insurer. And once again, I will point out that I have availed myself on a personal level with their services and they provide uh, excellent, outstanding um, customer service and also through rate reform and review. Next page, please. Um, so here is an extensive listing, I'm sure not in, uh, all inclusive of their uh, extensive COVID-19 efforts. Um, if you uh, click on uh, at your leisure, not now, um, the orders and bulletins, you'll see a uh, long list of orders and bulletins that the superintendent issued to protect consumers, um, major themes of which are on the health related front, access, access to care, so no cost pay or cost share for COVID screenings, uh, access to coverage, uh, deferring grace periods for premiums, which actually has expired, um, and uh, continuation of group coverage for employees subject to layoff. And also in the property casualty arena, um, uh, matters such as encouraging property and casualty insurers to offer premium reductions and credits to consumers to account for pandemic related uh, changes, such as encouraging voluntary auto rate reductions when we all stop driving very far. Um, next page, please. So here uh, you can see a breadth of their initiatives and emergent issues, which range from long-term care issues to uh, climate change um, and uh, e-commerce. And just below that, uh, contact information, um, including their website, uh, a how we can assist page, which is a very valuable tool and also contact information for their key um, staff uh, that you might be interacting with. Um, next page, please. Uh, the next agency is uh, the Office of Securities, ably overseen by uh, Ju the Administrator Judy Shaw. Uh, Administrator Shaw has served as, as the Securities Administrator since 2008 and has been with the, de um, the department since 2001, where she served as Deputy Superintendent for the Bureau of Insurance. She also represented the Bureau as an Assistant Attorney General uh, prior to that. Again, another wealth of experience and information. Administrator Shaw has a particular dedication to protecting the el elderly from financial exploitation and serves as co-chair of the main council for elder abuse, at, not for elder abuse, but uh, uh, um, the Office of Securities regulates broker dealers and their agents, so those who sell investments and investment advisors, financial planners, and their, res and their rep 
representatives, excuse me. Next page, please. So they accomplish their uh, regulatory functions through licensing, securities registration, examination, investigation, and enforcement. And I'll just note that in the past five years, they've had over $26 million in restitution ordered, uh, uh, over 900,000 in penalties, and um, five criminal prosecutions involving older investors. Next page, please. So here are a snapshot of services that the Office of Securities provides, um, including investigating complaints involving financial professionals and fraudsters and ex uh, helping companies ex uh, explore capital raising options. Um, just below that, uh, you can see their uh, initiatives and issues. Um, I noted uh, Administrator Shaw's particular um, interest in assisting uh, the elderly, and I encourage you to pay particular attention to the YouTube scam prevention videos that they have done in conjunction with the Maine State Police and AARP, a link of which is um, in that purple uh, box. Next page, please. So uh, here are some examples of their commitment to education and outreach and uh, at the bottom contact information, including their website and their key staff contacts. Next page, please. So uh, we are um, now at our fifth and final agency, the Office of Professional and Occupational Regulation or OPOR, which is overseen by uh, Commissioner Ann Head in her uh, position as Director of OPOR, which as I noted, she uh, has done since 1996. OPOR is a state umbrella agency with 37 licensing programs, 29 with licensing boards, and eight are directly administered by OPOR staff. Each licensing program is its own unique state agency. Uh, OPOR regulates a range of professions and occupations, and we've kind of broken it out into themes. Uh, so uh, mental health, physical health, trades and services, property, and uh, then a range of uh, licensing programs without boards. Next page, please. So uh, OPOR accomplishes its core function by licensing, and I would note that they uh, spend a tremendous amount of time assisting licensed applicants and responding to their questions so that they can get to a point of licensure. Um, enforcement, uh, we've included a link uh, for initiating a complaint. Um, for consumers, um, agency rulemaking, um, also included a link to the APA, which I encourage you to read in, um, I'm sure your copious spare time, and a commitment to public accessibility. Um, during COVID-19, OPOR successfully implemented um, virtual public meetings for its licensing boards. And while that may not seem, you know, everyone was doing virtual meetings, there are 29 of licensing boards. So it was really quite an accomplishment. Uh, next page, please. Um, so uh, below are some of the initiatives, emerging issues uh, for um, OPOR. Um, during COVID-19, they were uh, very involved with executive orders and guidance to address a range of issues um, such as telehealth. Uh, they um, enabled, uh, at which the executive orders also enabled the issuance of over 1,700 temporary licenses to out-of-state licensees, licensed healthcare providers to assist during the public health emergency, and issued guidance uh, for pharmacists, pharmacy interns, and pharmacy techs to administer uh, that, the COVID-19 vaccine under the Federal PrEP Act. Um, the one uh, emerging issue that I would point out is um, a uh, strong commitment to efforts to assist foreign trained and educated professionals to better navigate the professional licensing process. And very recently, OPOR and, um, partnered with the Cut Cutler Institute at the University of Southern Maine to uh, assist um, OPOR on this critical issue of uh, workforce and the economy. Um, and just below that, you can see contact information um, for consumers and office uh, and a contact for director head. Next page, please. And we also included OPOR administrator contact information, um, but this also is, gives you a really good um, visual of the breadth of, of boards and commissions and programs. Um, next page, please. So now we are on to the bo six boards affiliated with the department. Um, first of which is the Board of Dental Practice. 
um, and they um, um, license dentists, dental hygienists, denturists, dental assistants, and dental radiographers. Um, they are very involved uh, with um, uh, assisting consumers uh, with complaints, uh, and there's a link there to their frequently asked questions. Um, they had extensive COVID-19 efforts, um, and there is a COVID-19 uh, link to the Board of uh, Dental Practices COVID-19 work, and their executive director is Penny Valancourt. Um, Next, we have the Board of Licensure in Medicine. Um, they license MDs, medical doctors, and PAs. Uh, they offer a range of consumer resources, inclu including complaint filing, brochures, and frequently asked questions. Um, they also were very involved in COVID-19 efforts, uh, including the issuance of 784 COVID-19 emergency licenses to physicians uh, from out of, and physician assistants from out of state. And their executive director is Dennis Smith. Uh, next page, please. Next is the Maine State Board of Nursing. Um, and they have uh, over 30, close to 32,000 uh, active nursing uh, licenses um, that they oversee. Uh, one of the unique things about the Board of Nursing is that they also approve educational programs. Uh, so they establish standards for nursing um, education programs. Um, they were also involved in, the in a range of COVID-19 efforts and issued 231 temporary authorizations to out-of-state licensees. The next board is the Board of Optometry. Um, they um, license optometrists and they have 244 active licensees. Um, their COVID-19 effort was a um, executive order to allow um, the uh, uh, um, extension of uh, contact lens prescriptions. Um, they're um, administered by Tina Carp Carpenter. And next page, please. Um, the next board is the Board of Osteopathic Licensure, and they license um, doctors of osteopathy and PAs, um, and they have to uh, almost 2,500 total licensees. Um, they too offer a range of consumer resources and were involved in the COVID-19 effort, including issuing, issuing 20 temporary licenses to out-of-state osteopathic excuse me, physicians and physician assistants. And finally, and this is not a board uh, that this committee um, has jurisdiction over, but I will mention uh, the State Board of Licensure for Professional Engineers, uh, who oversees professional engineers, and their executive is David Jackson. So next page, please. So here is a um, handy phone directory. Uh, most of us, or many of us are, are, you know, like you working virtually, but our phones are forwarded. Um, and we do encourage you to reach out anytime by phone or email um, is often a, an even better way to reach us. Um, we also have the main DPFR website uh, listed there. So um, I would just point out that that took me, I think, 40 minutes when I first started and I've whittled it down to, I hope somewhere in the 15 minute range. I just need to take a breath. Um, <laughs> so. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, uh, it, it was quick, but it was also quite thorough. Um, and I just wanna say to committee members, uh, this is the agency that of uh, the administration that we will have a great deal to do with during our session. Thank you. Um, so I, I would now, uh, uh, um, uh, Colleen had um, recommended that we allow each of the agencies to introduce themselves just uh, by name, not go into details. So I um, will ask each of the agencies when I when I call on them, if that's okay uh, with your leave, um, Representative Tepler, um, I would invite them to turn on their mic and video and then uh, please turn it off again uh, when we move on to the next agency. And when we get to the q and I will invite um, everyone to turn on their video, but only turn on the mic when um, called on. Yes, Representative Tepler. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. We have to um, allow a moment oh. for our um, clerk to pull folks in as panelists um, to, because right now they're attendees. 
So uh, let's make sure he has the order of several people. I see he's pulled um, Commissioner Head in already. Um, and since she's first on the list, that's great. Um, but folks should know that as you're being pulled in, you'll, you'll feel like you're dropped out of the meeting and then you'll see a little spinning and you'll end up in the panelists. So just to let you know, that's what happens. Um, and uh, from there, Joan, I'll let you introduce uh, the commissioner. And should I just give it a second to allow people um, to uh, to get into the meeting? Yes, and if there's people that you would like to get into the meeting first, Joan, if you could say sure. who you'd like, then Christian will know who to. Okay, great. First, yeah. So, um, along with Commissioner Head, uh, we're going to have the affiliated board. So, um, Penny Valancourt, Kim Escabel, Dennis Smith. I realized I should go slower. Sorry, Christian. Um, Sue Strout. And Karen Bivens, who I see on there, um, Jerry Betts, um, Kristen Racine, and Christina Halverson, and Jen Hawk. Okay. See, that's Excellent. because they all fit on the on the tiles within <laughs> the gallery view. We planned it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I, I will now turn this over to Commissioner Head uh, to do introductions for OPOR and for the affiliated boards. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much. I don't see myself on the screen, but I assume that's okay. And you can uh, actually hear me. So I'm just going to launch into this. First, I want to thank Joan Cohen and her small work group for producing such a useful document for us. It really captures most of what we do in a very um, concise way. So thank you very much, Joan. Um, I wanna speak to you as commissioner to let you know that um, I am here as the chief administrative officer for the department. Um, I will come to you in my capacity as commissioner when we do our budget discussions, uh, whenever they happen. That is one of my prime uh, responsibilities as commissioner. And I'm also responsible for the department's legislative program. I'm grateful to have Joan working with me at this time. Uh, it is much, much easier for me uh, if I have a partner to, to work with on that. Of course, I work with the agency heads as well, but um, the day-to-day uh, the -day stuff, I need someone to uh, help me with that. Um, my other role is as director of one of the five agencies, Office of Professional and Occupational Regulation. Um, in this, in this um, committee, you will see about half of the uh, staff of OPOR in terms of the administrators working with healthcare related licensing programs. Um, I will name them in just a second, but um, this is a continuation of what was started in the last session when this committee uh, took an interest in the licensure of um, many healthcare professionals that are very important to our healthcare programs in Maine. Um, it, is a, um, it is an agency that is unique, I think. It is an umbrella agency with both healthcare related and non-healthcare non related licensing programs. There's a lot going on. Um, each agency has uh, rulemaking in progress. And we um, have recently, uh, recently joined us is an OPOR attorney, Kristen Racine, who has also been very helpful in moving forward on certain sensitive issues, including rulemaking and our complaint process. So I think with that, I will stop and introduce the team that I have working on healthcare uh, professional licensure. And I'm not sure how to do that, but I'll simply say, um, first of all, Karen Bivens is my, um, as director, I asked Karen Bivens to work with me on OPOR focused licensing legislative issues. So she is here somewhere, I, I don't see her. Um, 
there she is, I see her now. So Karen is, uh, has a lot of experience. She's also the director of the Real Estate Commission for Maine uh, and a number of other licensing boards. Uh, next, I'll go to um, uh, Kristen Halverson. Christina Halverson is handling our mental health uh, licensing programs and those include psychology, social work counselors and alcohol and drug counselors. Um, next, I, we have Jen Hawk, who is, who is handling the uh, speech language pathology program, as well as occupational therapy uh, and um, American Sign Language uh, and, and inter interpreters for ASL. Um, there she is there. And uh, finally, I want to mention Jerry Betts who is handling our pharmacy issues and uh, is instrumental in moving us forward in the pharmacy area. Um, she has a lot of experience and very helpful as we move into the new session. I'm sure I've forgotten someone, uh, but I also want to mention, even though um, Joan has mentioned the executive directors of, of uh, the five um, health-related affiliated boards. I will just say, um, I, don't, I don't think I need to go further with that, but I will say that these five affiliated boards are affiliated with the commission, with the, de the uh, department through the budget process. That is um, their link to the to the department, and I will also say that we have very strong working relationships with each of the affiliated boards, even though they have independent regulatory authority uh, and they have their own staffs. So I run the risk of missing someone, but I think I've said enough and I appreciate your attention. It's a lot to take in, I'm sure, but we are always here to help in any way. We are not lobbyists. We are information sources, and we we like that role that we play. Thanks, uh, May, Representative Tepler. I just wanted to thank the commissioner for her introduction to her staff, and I also wanted to ask if um, Ms. Cohen, you're going to be introducing the folks from the five affiliated boards. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so. Uh, from the Board of uh, Dental Practice, uh, Penny Valancourt, Maine State Board of Nursing, Kim Escobol. If you could um, please turn on your videos when I say your name, that would be great, thank you. Um, Board of Licensure and Medicine, Dennis Smith, and um, the uh, Osteopathic Board, Sue, Sue Strout. And there's, oh, who's upside down. Um, and uh, uh, just very briefly, also, um, Kristen Racine, uh, OPOR attorney, uh, didn't have a chance to make an appearance, so there she is. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we look forward to seeing you uh, as uh, I believe we'll be seeing all of you this session at some point uh, to report on updates to your rules and guidance. Thank you. Um, so I invite that group to turn off their videos, but stay at the ready. And the next group will be um, uh, the Bureau of Consumer Credit Protection uh, with Superintendent Lund, Mark Susi, and Christine uh, Four Fournier. Um, do we um, want to ask um, the commissioner and the folks we just were introduced to to um, allow for them to be put back in the attendees category so we can bring the other folks up and uh, be able to see them on the single screen? I think that's what we're hoping to do at this point. If that's okay, Jen. Christian, if you want to promote people, I'll I'll move people from uh, panelists back to attendees. How's I that? I believe the first group or the second group has been promoted already. Oh, okay, great. Good. There you go. I just was going to help you out if you needed it. Let me know.
So please forgive any glitches. Um, we are learning how to use this uh, new techno technological meeting format um, and bring people <clears throat> in and out of certain statuses and our technical whiz of a clerk has been doing a great job, um, but uh, it's still a little, a little choppy sometimes. So stay with us and uh, we'll do our best to um, get to you. That should be the full second set. Thank you. So Joan, go ahead. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Lund. Thank you, Joan, and uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Tepler. <clears throat> My name is Will Lund. I've <clears throat> served as superintendent, as you've heard, for a number of years and under a number of different administrations. Let me start by introducing our staff attorney, Mark Susi. You can just uh, wave, Mark. And Christine Fournier is a principal consumer credit examiner. <clears throat> our, uh, our range of jurisdictions is wide enough so not infrequently, especially toward the end of the session, we need to be in state and local handling uh, municipal tax lien issues, judiciary handling uh, foreclosure uh, activities, uh, and IDEA, a, a committee we spoke with this morning on a variety of uh, miscellaneous uh, financial services issues. And so it's important for, for us to have a couple of different folks uh, in Augusta from time to time. So I'm grateful for their help. I'm looking forward, we are looking forward to appearing before your committee uh, several times, at least uh, in the upcoming session on issues involving the Maine Consumer Credit Code, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I already have seen bills relating to credit cards and uh, foreclosures. And so we are, we are already uh, gearing up for a busy session. So, um, uh, Many of you have experience with our agency. Uh, we're happy also to receive consumer calls from you or from your staff members relating to constituent issues. And I appreciated Joan's reference to our um, uh, theory or our, our uh, basic principle of trying to put consumers first and to build all of our activities, including compliance examinations, licensing and outreach around the need to protect consumers. So I appreciate your time and uh, uh, we appreciate the opportunity today. Thank you very much, Superintendent Lund. Um, and I guess uh, we'll hold, if the committee has any questions for any of the uh, divisions, um, just hold them till we're done introducing all the folks. And I'll let Joan take it away. And um, Christian, just as I mentioned, you can, um, I believe, ask uh, Kristen Racine and Christina Halverson and Jen Hawk, as well as the other folks you moved to, uh, to panelists to go back to being attendees, if possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Joan, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, so our next agency will be the Bureau of Insurance. Oh, sorry, um, I'm going in alphabetical order. The Bureau of Financial Institutions, and that would be Superintendent Lloyd LaFountain, uh, John Barr, and Gordon Lorundo. I do not see John on the call but uh, the other two. Yeah, John will not be on the call. He's unavailable today. So uh, Representative Tepler, I'd like to um, you know, thank you for hosting and chairing the committee today. And thank you, Joan, for the great overview you did of our agency together with the other agencies uh, within the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation. Um, in addition to myself, others that you will see from the Bureau of Financial Institutions, also known as BFI, uh, you will see uh, John Barr, who's a deputy superintendent, and you'll see Gordon Lorando, who is the um, staff attorney for the Bureau. Um, I would say well over 90% of our work legislative is before the HCIFS committee. Uh, we do make some uh, brief appearances before the Judiciary Committee, and oftentimes that's depending upon uh, where the two committees decide to send a lot of the foreclosure-related bills. Uh, primarily, uh, the issues that we will deal with before your committee are from Title IX-A and Title IX-B, 
As Joan indicated, we um, regulate state chartered banks and state chartered credit unions. Uh, we have no jurisdiction over the national banks or the federal credit unions. However, in the event that you have consumer uh, constituents who have issues with national banks or federal credit unions, uh, feel free to forward those complaints to us and we will send them directly to the agency within federal government that would be handling those and we'll be able to track those. Um, we're still not quite sure uh, the volume of work we'll have before your committee this session. Uh, we've seen some bill titles that will involve us, but we're not quite sure of the language as of yet. Um, occasionally, you will see bills in, with, in which Will Lund's office, the Bureau of Consumer Credit Protection, and our office, BFI, overlap. So you might see both of us involved in, in discussions on a bill. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, either yesterday or today, you received the annual report from my office. It was sent to you um, by mail. We mailed it out on Friday, but with the holiday, it probably did not go out in the US mail until Tuesday. So hopefully it's coming your way. It's a great resource. Um, those of you who have been on the committee in the past have received it. We provide you the information as to who we regulate, um, their size, asset size, um, and other pending issues or important issues that the Bureau has faced over the past year. And specifically, I'd, I'd, I encourage you to pay attention to the section that we drafted on COVID related issues. So thank you, we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Superintendent. And in fact, I believe we will be scheduling um, a hearing for your uh, recertification as superintendent. I don't think recertification is the right word, but uh, we, uh, we look forward to seeing you for that as well. Thank you. I spoke to Christian earlier today and I believe we're scheduled for February 4th. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll let Joan tell us who else we'll be hearing from in a minute. Uh, next, uh, we will have the Bureau of Insurance uh, with Superintendent Chapa, uh, Joanne Rowling Secunda, Sandra Darby, Marty Hooper, and Ben Yardley. Oh, am I in? Good. Well, good afternoon, Representative Tepler, and thank you for the inv invitation. And it's good to see you all again. Um, as I, as uh, Joan said, and thank you, Joan, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I'm the Superintendent of Insurance. Just a few words, very few words about the Bureau. Um, we do regulate other lines of insurance, although it doesn't seem other than the health insurance. You know, all lines of insurance, you know, homeowners, auto insurance, workers' comp, fall under our purview. And the United States is somewhat unique. We have a state-based national system in that there's really no, no overarching federal regulator for insurance. It's uh, Congress delegated that to the states and under the McCarran-Ferguson Act in the 1940s. So we are the primary regulator of the insurance industry. And by we, I mean the individual states. And with me today are, you've met Joanne Rowling Secunda, who's the director of our cons consumer healthcare unit, and Ben Yardley, who's the general staff attorney who spends a majority of his time at the legislature this time of year. And Marty Hooper is a life and health actuary. You'll be seeing a lot of Marty this year. She's critical and uh, she's an actuary and uh, does and is very involved in overall health policy. And Sandra Darby is a light, is the auto property casualty actuary for um, auto insurance, homeowners, workers comp. Um, again, critical uh, function at the Bureau, and you'll be seeing those the, the us for on a regular basis. In addition, you probably see like Bob Wake, our general counsel occasionally as well. But with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, Ms. Cohen, are we done with introductions? Um, no, we, one more agency. Okay, so <laughs> Superintendent, we'll ask, we've asked our members to hold off on their questions until we're done with all our introductions. So thank you for introducing us to everyone. It's our first chance to see uh, Marty this year. Um, but um, we will, I'm sure, have a few questions for you during the Q&A period. So thanks very much. And I'll let Joan go ahead and take, again, the lead. 
All right, thank you so much, uh, Representative Tepler. Our final agency is the Office of Securities uh, with uh, Securities Administrator Judy Shaw, Carla Black, and Jim Liddell. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Um, as Joan mentioned, my name is Judy Shaw. I'm the administrator for the Office of Securities. I'm joined today by Carla Black, who is the Deputy Securities Administrator and General Counsel. Carla is responsible for a whole host of things, not just legislative, but um, certainly primarily responsible for our investigative and enforcement functions, including our criminal investigations and prosecutions. I'm also joined by Jim Liddell, who is a staff attorney in our office who assists with legislative matters, as well as our corporation finance component of the work that we do. Our mission is pretty simple, protect main investors, that's it. Uh, we do it in a whole host of ways that Joan covered quite nicely for us. Uh, Joan did mention that one of the things I'm quite passionate about is senior and elder issues. I do co-chair the Maine Council for Elder Abuse Prevention, and I'm very honored that Governor Mills appointed me to be the public sector co-chair of the Elder Justice Coordinating Partnership, which is currently in the process of developing an elder justice roadmap for the state of Maine, which will be presented to the governor in December. We're very much looking forward to working with all of you. I am a native of Aroostook County, Fort Fairfield to be exact. So I am very pleased to see Senator Stewart and a, and a fellow Aroostook County uh, individual on the committee. Um, I'll end by simply saying, if you need anything at all, uh, whether it's information or you have a constituent that could benefit from our services, or if I can use any of the knowledge and expertise that I have been able to develop around elder issues and other vulnerable adults, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to help, we are here to serve. And as the commissioner said, we are not lobbyists. We are here to try to help inform your decisions and to assist your constituents. And I'll leave it with at that so that you can get to your question and answer period. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Superintendent Shaw. Appreciate it, or Director Shaw. Um, Whatever you want. <laughs> no, I think you have a title and I really should know it. So I apologies. Not at all. Uh, but um, yes, now I'm going to ask the committee if they have questions for any of the bureaus that they've heard from. Um, unless, Joan, is there anything that you would like to finish up with before we turn to the committee? Uh, no, I uh, would be happy to have you turn to the committee. Um, are, is everyone still in participant mode so that they can respond or should we have um, the uh, agency heads uh, come back in um, I, and I do have, uh, I was asked, um, given one request uh, from the Bureau of Insurance, they did want to address uh, one piece of information that they wanted to clarify from uh, Tuesday. Uh, and I believe Joanne um, uh, Secunda Rowling wanted to address that. So I ask leave to uh, um, allow her to do that if, if, uh, if that's appropriate. Sure, why don't we do that first? Um, and bring um, Ms. Rawling Secunda back um, to address um, something from Tuesday, and then we can move directly into our Q and A period. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to expand on my answer to uh, Representative Arford's question from the other day about when you can um, go to the Bureau of Insurance as vis-a-vis -vis when you're appealing um, with the insurance company. And I talked on Tuesday specifically really about the complaint process within the Bureau of Insurance, which you can do simultaneously with going to the insurance company. But there is one kind of subset that you do have to do the appeals first, and that's called external review. External reviews are um, they're done by independent um, reviewers that are contracted by the Bureau of Insurance to look at situations of medical necessity. So, for example, um, if you 
believe that you need to have back surgery. Your doctor says you need back surgery and you go to get a prior auth and the insurance company says, no, we're not going to approve that because we think you can do PT. And this is all hypothetical, obviously. And um, you would have to appeal that with the insurance company first. If they still say, no, we're not going to give you the prior auth, that can become an external review process with the Bureau. So that's the one exception to sending in something the same time to both entities. So I just wanted to clarify that. So thank you so much for indulging me on that. Yep, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. I, I clicked the button twice and it didn't go, but that's life. So thank you very much uh, for clarifying Ms. Rawlings, Secunda, and um, I guess what I'm gonna ask my fellow committee members to do is use the raise hand function if you can. Um, uh, Representative Quint, please feel free to just say, Madam Chair, if you have a question or questions. Um, and uh, otherwise I'll wait to hear from my fellow committee members with questions for the um, superintendents and directors of the bureaus and the commissioner, I guess, as well. I believe that um, Christian is pulling them in now. Yes. Is um, Commissioner Head in? Perhaps she had to jump off for some other. I had just promoted her, but no, I do not see her in. Up oh, here she there comes. There she is. Here she comes. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, are there questions from the committee for these folks? It's a lot to digest, I know, but um, I actually will start off with two questions and maybe that will help other folks uh, get their thoughts together um, as since we've gone through a lot here. Um, and both of my questions I think are for um, Superintendent Lund. Superintendent Lund, um, I have never seen those booklets that are in the, um, the directory that Ms. Cohen put together. I was wondering if you could supply copies of those booklets for members of the committee. They look like something that might be useful to our constituents if we knew what they were. Absolutely, and I apologize if those didn't make their way to you. The uh, one focus, the one with the camouflage cover focuses on veterans uh, credit issues. Uh, I know there is an extended student loan booklet as well, but we'll make sure to get all the recent booklets uh, to the members of the committee. That's great because I, I hadn't seen them and I know that, um, that they might be helpful to some of my constituents. Um, my second question for you is um, how can you give us an update on how it's going since you became or your department became the student loan ombudsman? Um, that was a new role for you, uh, and I'm just wondering how it's going. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> the program here is about a, a year old now, and there's an it's a, a cliche expression called drinking from a fire hose. And in terms of the amount of knowledge needed to effectively administer Maine's Student Loan Bill of Rights, we do feel like that sometimes yeah. there is an, uh, an incredible amount of information from an incredible number of sources that we are trying to absorb. And if you add on top of that the layer of uh, moratoria, uh, many of many of the uh, the developments have originated uh, from Washington in Washington. So so student loan um, student loan repayments and interest have been stopped on certain federally related student loans. That has been continued on what seems to be a month to month basis by the Depart uh, Department of Education in Washington. And, and uh, furthermore, um, uh, I believe the new president <clears throat> has extended <clears throat> or plans to extend that perhaps beyond uh, into the fall of this year. So num number one, we're trying to, we're trying to be 
certain that we give the right advice to consumers who call. When I talk about the complexity, there are different programs that relate to different types of loans. There is income-driven repayment, which is a goal for some. There is uh, an underutilized function called uh, an uh, there is an underutilized function uh, um, uh, called uh, public, serv public service forgiveness. And uh, uh, it's been around for a number of years, but, but uh, when folks started digging into it, they found that at least as of early last year, one or two percent of all the applicants uh, were granted, successfully granted public service loan forgiveness. These are folks who work in nonprofit uh, employment for a certain number of years, anticipating that if they make 10 years worth of payments that whatever the balance uh, is uh, on their loans will be forgiven. Um, and uh, finally, of course, as you know, uh, our new president campaigned on a platform of some level of forgiveness of student loans. Uh, $10, the first $10,000 was a level that was frequently uh, mentioned. Uh, already conservatives are saying that's gonna increase the debt too much or who's gonna pay for it. Uh, uh, progressives are saying that's <laughs> ten thousand is not enough, uh, given the basic level of some of some uh, folks' uh, uh, student loan uh, debt. So we're going to see some tugging and hauling, uh, and uh, our job is to provide the most the most accurate advice to consumers when they call to borrowers when they call, and that depends to a great deal uh, uh, to a great extent on what kind of loan they have, what kind of school they went to, is the school still in existence, or were they was it the whole process a sham? Uh, and uh, and so uh, uh, it, it, it is a lot of information and we're doing the best uh, we can as the named student loan ombudsman. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, and I guess I was um, worried when you became the student loan ombudsman about the capacity of your department. So um, I hope that you will come to us if capacity does become an issue for Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other members of the committee with questions for any of the superintendents or the commissioner? Ah, I see one, yes. Representative Matheson, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for this overview of the departments as uh, a freshman legislator, it's really interesting to, to see how all of these departments interact with each other. And I really appreciate that work. And I have some homework to do to read over some, some of this. But I guess what I'm curious about is, uh, and this may be more of a, a question for Joan, I think, um, or Colleen. Um, so it sounds like there are um, one, two, three, four, five, um, agencies that are under the DPFR, and then there are six affiliated um, boards associated. I'm curious, what is, where do, why are those six boards affiliated and not others? And where do some other boards like for registered dietitians or naturopathic doctors, where do those come in with the affiliations or do they? I think I'll take that question, uh, Representative Suzanne Head. Um, it is curious that there are certain licensing boards that are off on their own with their own staffs. They have different locations. Actually, most of them are up the street from the state house uh, in a location up the hill. Um, I think the only answer to that is that over time, as as the structure of state government started to change and smaller programs were moved into an umbrella agency, those six professions had very strong feelings about being in another agency uh, where they did not have the same uh, authority. And it's, it's not really authority because I have no authority for the boards within O4. Um, I, can, I can speak with them, I can persuade them, but ultimately the decisions they make with good information are their own. Um, so 
I think the only reason is that there was a very strong lobby for each of the affiliated boards at the time these movements were being contemplated. And the group of six had very strong lobbies and they remained away from the department, but linked through the state budget process. Um, uh, to speak to your question specifically, the Board of Dietitians licensure is within OPOR. There is a board. I realized that you have that in your background and I had intended to speak with you uh, directly about uh, board positions that we need to fill if you are in the field and you have ideas for us, um, that would be really important. And we also have the Board of Complementary Healthcare Providers and that board licenses midwives, acupuncturists and um, naturopathic doctors. So everyone is covered, but the difference between an affiliated board and an OPOR board is not that great we all do the same work. It's just that I have a full-time staff of 55 people and they are, dis they are assigned a group of boards. Whereas an affiliated board has a staff devoted to that one set of professions. So every state is different. You'll see different configurations. We have merged certain boards together in some cases for efficiency that has worked out very well. So uh, I, I will stop talking, but I appreciate the question and it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank, thanks for that question, Representative Matheson. I see Representative Morris has a question as well. Go ahead, Representative Morris. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I had a question for Ann Head, kind of um, going back on what she said about the individual boards being responsible for their own um, matters. Um, and I, I'm a licensed realtor. And I think, you know, a number of us got your communication back in November regarding complying with the uh, coronavirus and the uh, executive order. So is that to mean that the any issues that may arise from that would be handled by those individual boards because um, you might imagine I've gotten some questions from constituents about it as well as some questions from uh, other licensed professionals as well. Yes, um, I can speak to that. The, um, the letter that went out to all of our licensees actually um, was intended to remind everyone of the of the um, necessity really of sticking with all of the safety provisions that the CDC and the main and the governor's um, office through her EOs, executive orders. It was simply a reminder that we needed to keep going. Um, there are very few instances where a one licensee um, may have had some complaints filed through not through our complaint process, but through the DECD's response re reporting portal um, that was opened up to give the public a way of providing feedback about what was going on. Um, to this day, there is no licensee who has been um, disciplined at all. Um, many of the reports that are forwarded to us couldn't be substantiated. And th that is a problem because um, in our line of work, when we take on a complaint and we investigate it, that complaint can't be processed unless, there, unless we can verify certain information. So I know that that letter, which actually the governor asked us to do, was, it was interpreted uh, in, in a way that wasn't intended. It was just a reminder uh, that we all need to do our part, including licensees. And some of those licensees are in healthcare practices. Um, so I think it was a good reminder, but it did stir up some negative feelings. And I believe we've addressed those. 
Yeah, I, I think there were just, you know, like, I, as I said, there's a lot of, um, it, it certainly, it, it got some heartburn, I guess, would be the best way I would say it. Probably a little heartburn on it. But I just wanted to ask it as a clarifying. Um, and you did answer the next question I had, which was if there's been any discipline. I'm pleased to hear, too, that if it can't be substantiated, that we're not, you know, it, it's, as you say, it's an education thing, not a witch hunt. That, that's correct. Okay. That is what I figured. I just wanted to ask the question. Thank you. I'm glad that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, there we go. Okay, so um, I, Representative Evans has a question. Please proceed, Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for presenting today. I, the information has been very useful. I just wanted to go back and uh, direct this question probably to uh, uh, Superintendent Chapa. I know I just butchered your last name, but I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, one aspect, you, you, you used the term a uh, state-based uh, uh, national insurance program is what we seem to have. Can you expand on that a little bit? Certainly, and thank you for the question, Representative. Yeah, the United States is unique. I, in the 1940s, Congress, insurance is clearly interstate commerce and therefore it's subject to you know, federal regulation. But in the 40s, Congress passed the mccarran ferguson Act, which delegated the regulation of insurance to the state. So it's unique among financial service industries. So each state regulates their, their industry. Like if an insurance company wants to do business in Maine, it has to be licensed in Maine. If a producer wants to do business in Maine, it has to be licensed in Maine. And that's by my office. But because it's clearly interstate compact and it's truly national and international now insurance, there's something called the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and every state belongs and is an active member of that association. And through that association, we try and coordinate policy and model laws, particularly around prudential or financial regulation of insurance companies. And in fact, the first bill that I think is coming for your committee from, from me is a bill on financial um, reinsurance, which is something called an accreditation bill, which I'll describe more in detail at that time. But again, it's a state-based system where the states have the ultimate authority of who operates within their state, but it's clearly interstate com um, commerce. So we coordinate through the, the NAIC very actively to try and um, ease states, insurance companies being able, uh, being able to operate inter interstate, but at the same time retaining our authority so you can actually pass laws that only apply in Maine. And then if an insurance company wants to do business in Maine, they have to comply with the laws of, of the state of Maine. Thank you. Um, and Superintendent, are you still the chair of the NAIC? No, that's a one year, thankfully it's a one year position. Um, that, that, that was a heavy lift. It was enjoyable, but once was enough. Okay, well. As a president emeritus or chair emeritus of that organization, I'm sure you'll keep us well informed about things that are going on there. Um, and now we have a question from Representative Melorano. Go ahead, Representative Melorano. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks to all of you for being here and uh, for your service and for your expertise. Um, was just wondering if there's anything you want us to know about how the pandemic may have changed things in your, you know, like the nature of your work in your departments or um, how things have changed for the industries that you regulate uh, in, in uh, relation to the pandemic. Um, this is okay. Anne. Um, I'm sure others of my colleagues have a slightly different answer, but I did want to say that um, we have seen through the pandemic, even though it's horrible, there are certain changes that have occurred over this time that indicate that the current system of state regulation of, of uh, professions and occupations should change, should be more flexible in the kinds of rules that are enacted and, and statutes that are enacted. And I think no, no one is surprised that telehealth has become, it has overtaken 
the, the health related professions because it allows professionals who are licensed by the state to reach more uh, individuals who need service and no one has to travel. There are lots of benefits. And I know that there will be bills in front of this committee um, to allow certain parts of telehealth to continue on past the pandemic. Um, and I'll go out on a limb here and say that I agree with that. Um, I do think there are some details that need to be worked out, but in general, I think that we haven't been able to take advantage of the full array of telehealth services until now. And if there's, there's really no, no um, bright light in the pandemic, other than we may be able to be in a position now to shift to telehealth when travel and contact with each other is so dangerous. So um, I think that's one example of regulation that now should be more flexible. And we're seeing that across every state as we watch to see what they are doing to make uh, at least licensing more open to more people. Uh, so I'll stop there. And I'm sure my colleagues will have additional information to share. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say representative, from a staff perspective, I, I have to really give my hats off to our staff. They, they did not miss a beat when we went remote and that was literally within a day, it seemed like. I know it was probably a little longer but it's, and I think it's true for every agency. Uh, the, the staff picked up right where they left off. We, we have no discernible drop off in, in productivity. In fact, in some ways it's increased. So I think we have some evaluation to do going forward on how do we blend work at home with, you know, once a, once a pandemic is over, but what's that saying? Never let a good crisis go to waste. I think there's some good lessons learned we can learn here. As far as working with the industry, I think it's much the same. I mean, I still prefer face-to-face -face meetings, but I think we've adapted and um, the industry is responsive and I, you know, I have no problem getting access to the people I need to talk to when there's a problem. If I could add from consumer credit's perspective, right away we received questions from industry regarding home offices. Uh, the issue of whether a home office needed to be licensed as an office uh, had never really been solved or never been, been addressed directly. We fairly quickly decided that if records and communications could be kept secure, if telephone calls, for example, were routed through the company's uh, 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 systems so that, so that folks weren't making calls on their own, that folks did not have to license their own home office as an office. And this relates to mortgage loan originators, for example, even debt collectors and uh, mortgage servicers. So all three industries immediately asked for consideration, and that was a fairly easy uh, decision to make to allow uh, those uh, folks to work from home without having to hang a license on their uh, office wall at home. Um, from the uh, Bureau of Financial Institutions perspective, um, we had two issues. First of all, it was how can we migrate our staff which was half based in the office, the other half were on-site examiners. How could we get them to fully work remotely? And fortunately, we had the technology in our possession that we were able to do that. We did have to go out and buy a few um, air cards for individuals and buy printers, but we were successfully able to migrate people to home-based in order to conduct examinations. Now, fortunately, the financial institutions we were dealing with were able to successfully interact with us as far as our IT systems so we could get the documents that we need needed on a, on a regular basis. The other issue we had is how, how was the industry going to fare? As you all know, and we dated here in the office around March 16th when, when I sent everyone home. Um, and at that time, about a week later, you started to see banks um, announce that they would be closing their lobbies and going drive-through only. Um, our first concern that we had together with that of federal regulators is what would that do as far as liquidity for financial institutions? When there's a lockdown or even a snowstorm, um, the first thing people do is they flock to the grocery store or in some cases they flock to the banks to, or credit unions to get cash. 
And so we were concerned that would the institutions have the cash on hand um, in, in the early part of the pandemic. And fortunately, they did. There were a few situations where people did some pretty large withdrawals, but the most part, uh, people sort of continued to conduct their routine transactions. We likewise had concerns that um, real estate closure, closings um, would be delayed, but fortunately the uh, financial institutions were able to develop a workaround specifically with the whole notary issue. Um, and so uh, they really didn't miss a beat as far as, uh, as, as closing those loans. I, I'm happy to report that um, we're pretty confident here in the Bureau that thus far the financial institutions, the state charters have fared well through the course of the pandemic. And if I could just do a very quick cleanup um, here. Um, there were two areas in particular that I wanted to note for you. One was we noticed that our call volume from uh, consumers was down. And so we quickly worked to do a public service announcement to remind um, the public that state government was open, our office was open, that we were all readily available to continue to provide them with assistance. The other thing to Superintendent Chapa's point, any crisis provides opportunities. One of the things that our agency has done for over 25 years is require that every person that is a resident of Maine or has a footprint in Maine that wants to be licensed, spends an hour with me um, to do a new licensee seminar. And historically that has been an in-person seminar. Not only have we made it virtual, we are now in the process of trying to find a way to provide it on the web so that new licensees can take that seminar 24 seven, seven days a week so that their license application can be processed more quickly and they can get to um, the business of operating in main securities industry. Thank you for the question, it was exceptional. Thank you for all of the answers. And thank you, uh, Representative Malarano, for that question. Do you have any follow-ups? No, okay. So I'm going to go to Senator Brenner. Senator Brenner, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. I have a question about whether or not members of boards are compensated in any way. Um, I'll take that question as well. Um, our board members are compensated for a, their daily, they have a daily rate uh, that's set by uh, Title V, I believe. Um, and that is currently $35 a day for their service uh, to of the citizens of Maine through the licensing board process. It doesn't seem like enough but I have not been able to get too much interest in raising that, but it's always an issue when um, new licensing board members are recruited. They sometimes ask, what is the compensation? Theoretically, they are volunteers. So the $35 a day plus their, a, a certain amount for lunch. Um, they also do get their travel um, back and forth uh, to the guard, I, I just wanted to mention that we are located away from the um, Augusta complex, the state, state house complex. We are in Gardner, which is about 10 minutes away from where you are normally situated. Um, so they do get travel, um, they get a, a lunch um, bon bonus or invoice and $35 per day. Um, there, so that's the standard. Um, so they do get compensated, but it's not very much. Thanks. Was, was there more to that question that I, that I missed? Any follow-up, Senator Brenner? I think my, what I was wondering is about vacancies and sourcing talent for boards. And um, I can also tell you that I work closely with the governor's boards and commission staff in the, in the state house to recruit new board members. Um, we are, we're starting to see that there's more interest in board member positions because of the lack of travel. Um, and I can tell you that during the, during the pandemic at the beginning stages and right through until last week, the governor's staff 
every person on the governor's staff was involved in the response to the pandemic. So board appointments slowed down and we do have some vacancies and I would be happy to share those vacancies with this committee. Um, I know you have professionals that are interested in certain professions. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to share that information and, and meet with you to, uh, if you have someone you wanna recommend, it's always useful to have more information about the particular board's um, frequency of meeting, the kinds of issues that they deal with. Um, there are so many questions. It, it's, a, it's not quite like being a new representative or senator, but it is a hard job that you can't really explain in an hour. You have to be involved in it before you understand um, the difficulties. And we're here in the Office of, of Licensing, of Professional Occupational Licensing to help you with that. I'm talking to you now as board member, prospective board members. So I know you can't be, but we would be very interested in any names that you, of, of folks who might be interested. Again, so it would be terrific, um, Commissioner, if you would share uh, that information with um, Ms. McCarthy Reed and um, she can distribute it to committee members for, for those of um, us who are professionals in health fields who might be interested in helping you recruit board members. Thank you. Ah, I see um, Representative Morris has another question. Please go ahead, Representative Morris. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to go back real, um, on the issue of telehealth and, and licensing. Um, have we licensed people through telehealth, um, through out of state, out of state, from out of state through this um, pandemic and um, also in terms of the licensing people from out of state in general? Um, and if so, how has that gone and, and what would, what does it uh, tell for potential policy changes in the future? A wonderful question, wonderful topic. It is challenging and I'll, I'll give you my answer very succinctly. Right after the uh, pandemic hit, the, one of the first executive orders that the governor put out was to create um, the ability of out-of-state professionals to be, become temporary emergency licensees, which means that it, at no cost to them, there was no fee involved. So at this point we have, and I think Joan mentioned this earlier, um, uh, but we've issued those temporary licenses to 1,700 out-of-state professionals primarily in the mental health and physical health areas. Um, the question is, what happens to those temporary licenses at the end of the pandemic, if it ever comes? Um, so that's a policy question for this committee. Um, there will be telehealth bills coming to your attention that will raise similar questions. Um, we, we have, um, a bill that will probably go to the uh, idea committee and that involves license endorsement of out-of-state licensees. That would be uh, very similar to making a temporary licensee permanent, but they have to have a license without discipline in another state in order to be uh, considered for license by endorsement. These are all policy questions that we can help with in terms of information, um, but the, there are some sticky issues in creating a telehealth setting that is um, acceptable to all sectors of the regulated community. And um, if, if there is anything that Superintendent Chapa would like uh, to say about the finance end of it. I'm only here to talk about the licensing part of it, not, not the parity uh, in terms of um, insurance uh, 
uh, reimbursement for that. So those are all good issues. They will be very controversial, I think, uh, but we are here to provide any information that you ask us for. Uh, Representative Tepper, if I may, I'll just add a brief. Um, yeah, we, the Bureau issued an order that required payment parity for telehealth Again, it only applies to fully insured plans. It doesn't apply to ERISA plans and you know the other segments I don't regulate, but for fully insured plans, I have an order out there for the duration um, of, the, of the emergency, which shows as Commissioner Head said, no sign of abating yet, that requires parity, um, payment parity for telehealth with in-person visits. Um, that, there's no statutory requirement. The current statutory requirement is parity for, for the offer um, telehealth, access to telehealth, but I expect payment parity is gonna be an issue in front of the committee you'll, you'll be hearing about. Um, just one more comment from me. I think there's no question that the citizens of Maine are very concerned that they will be, to be able to continue their relationships with perhaps an out-of-state um, provider of, of mental health service or whatever. So it's not just a regulation, I mean, a licensing issue. It's, it's a consumer issue um, that needs very careful consideration. Yeah, this is going, definitely going to be something we're going to be grappling with. Um, and particularly as we've had a lack of access to mental health professionals in some parts of the state, um, and uh, I just, you know, I know that we'll have a lot of discussions around bills on this area to come. So thanks for those thoughts and that update. Um, I think that's important stuff. And um, now I'm going to turn to Representative Matheson again. Just real quickly, thank you so much for that information. Uh, in terms of boots on the ground and being in Kittery, which is a district that's very close to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. I'm wondering from the insurance parity um, issue, is there in the licensing challenges for practitioners who are seeing somebody through telehealth that, it, that does not live currently in Maine, but might live in New Hampshire? How was that, um, how was that controlled under that executive order in terms of the location of the patient versus the location of the practitioner and insurance reimbursement? The location uh, of the- Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Eric. I mean, it, it'd have to be covered <coughs> in the policy issued in Maine. I mean, if it's a policy issued in Maine to, a, to in, in the eye of jurisdiction, then it, then it applies. If, it's a, if the policy is issued in, under New Hampshire, um, in, New, in the state of New Hampshire rather than that my order does not apply. So it's more an issue, um, Representative Matheson, of the location of the policy purchased than of, or, or the employer perhaps in, in some cases than it is of where the individual resides per se. Okay, that makes sense because <coughs> the person could reside in a different location but the policy was purchased from an employer <coughs> resides in Maine. So it just gets confusing as a practitioner to, to <coughs> figure out where you can actually talk to that person in a, in a telehealth. But I, I'm sure this will be one of the, the challenges that we'll be discussing as a committee. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now we'll hear from Representative Arford. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And I also want to thank uh, the people who are with us today for this excellent presentation of a huge amount of information. And I don't, I, I'm assuming that the telehealth is going to be a major issue. We will have a number of conversations with you folks about it. But for right now, I just wanna make sure I understand the thread of this conversation in that um, because of the pandemic, um, the provider base was expanded for people specifically in the behavioral health field. And a number of those providers actually resided outside the borders of the state of Maine, whereas before they were residing within the borders. I mean, the people that were servicing the client population. So what changed was 
because of the pandemic, people that were residing outside of Maine were able to get these temporary licenses and serve people living in Maine. And if that's the case, my only thing I'm wondering about is um, how did this apply? How did this affect the networks, you know, the in and out of network for billing purposes? Was there an issue with that? Well, that, that's a very good question, Representative, and I may need Joanne to um, supplement what I'm about to say. But uh, you still this, you still have to be in the network. I mean, but I issued another order. The network has to be adequate, and if this, if the network is overwhelmed, then the consumer has to go outside the network because they can't get access for because the network's inadequate. Then, under Maine law, the consumer is only responsible for the network for the, what they would would normally be charged had the service been in network. But the network requirement does not, it has, was not affected by my, my order on payment parity, nor if you automatically license, if the out of state practitioner gets licensed in Maine, that doesn't automatically gain them entrance to an insurer's network. So it's, as everything else, it's a, it's a little more complicated okay. as you start peeling back the onion. Thank you. I see Representative Brooks has her hand up. Please proceed, Representative Brooks. <clears throat> yes, I had a question for uh, Superintendent Chapa. Were there other measures uh, taken or policy changes that were made during the pandemic that were um, helpful and would continue beyond the pandemic, would like to be continued beyond the pandemic? Well, I think that's a discussion we have to have with the committee. I've issued, I think, upwards of 15 bulletins and orders, a combination. And that's what I was getting at. I didn't mean it, you know, uh, sarcastically. We shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. I think we need to step back and evaluate what what works, what what I had to do for, for, via emergency order, as opposed to having the authority under the law. And I think that's a conversation we need to be thoughtful about. But um, going forward, I, I look forward to that conversation. Follow up, uh, Representative Brooks. Do you have any questions? to follow up with? Yeah, I would look forward to that uh, knowledge going forward as well, like when, we, when we're able to address things that we'd like to continue. And if I might say, um, Superintendent Chapa, I don't feel that that's sarcastic at all. And I think that you have made a very good point about um, things that we have learned through the pandemic that we may want to hang on to, to improve our healthcare response in Maine. Um, okay, Heidi, your hand is still up. Do you have another, I'm sorry, Representative Brooks, do you have another question? No, okay. No, no I didn't realize you, know, you put your hand down uh, with a click as well. Sometimes I've been putting folks' hands down just so I know that they're done. Um, so it looks like we may be coming to a close here today um, on our afternoon orientation meeting. Um, um, Ms. McCarthy-Reed, do you have any follow-ups for the committee that you want to add? Um, just two things to um, mention about scheduling, just for the committee to um, keep in mind, Christian will be sending out a weekly schedule um, for next week, um, but you may have received already an invitation to attend the appropriations hearing on Wednesday, um, January 27th at 10 a.m. Um, there is a small part of the supplemental budget that affects um, agencies programs within the HCIFS committee's jurisdiction. Um, committee members are welcome to attend that. I, I think we are the first committee listed at 10 a.m. that morning. I think it will be um, to the extent that you want to attend and listen to testimony, it would should be very quick, um, shouldn't take very long for the portion to be heard that relates to the HCIFS committee. So I just wanted you to be aware that that will be part of your weekly schedule in addition to our regularly scheduled plans for public hearings um, and potential work sessions on Tuesday and Thursday of next week. And, and I'll get information to you tomorrow with some background about the supplemental budget um, items that are included. So you'll have a chance to review that in advance of the hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. McCarthy Reed. And I, I also want to remind those of you who are freshman legislators that it's very important that you check your legislative email 
for um, your links to these meetings um, and for information that may come from Christian. Uh, you may have gotten used to using other emails, but that legislative email is really vital uh, as a method of communication uh, from both our clerk and um, our analyst and from the chair. So please, and, and I would also like to really thank the whole staff of DPFR for being present today and the commissioner um, and everyone. It was a great and informative session. Thank you very much to uh, Ms. Cohen for her presentations. And um, I guess we'll sign off and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you next week for our first public hearings.